What's happening, future certified public accountants? How are you today? It's a great day to study to be a CPA. Um, again, this is going to be a three-hour session. I think uh, um, prior to this, we were doing one hour, two hour. So we are building your mental endurance. As you know, <clears throat> each part of the CPA exam continues to be four hours. You can't afford to get anything wrong exam day because you're mentally fatigued. So part of what we're going to be doing today is no break, three hours straight through, banging out questions. We want to help you build up that mental endurance. <clears throat> and you'll see that we're going to be having fun. So that three hours is actually going to fly by, believe it or not. So, uh, you know, also good practice for exam day. You cannot waste time getting up and going to the bathroom. So uh, you should be practicing with diapers, right? So uh, if you do have to use the restroom, you could just sit, smile at your seat and uh, continue to work questions as you do your business. <laughs> I'm only serious, I'm only serious. All right, so let's see what we got. For those of you who don't know UWorld, the reason I joined, they are a leader in technology. They are on the cutting edge, um, not only in terms of writing the content, the questions, but all the technology, all the software that's involved in you know predicting, hey, you're great in this topic, time to move on. Let's study hard, but let's study efficiently. So you don't want to waste time spinning your wheels on topics where you're stronger because we can measure against various metrics that relative to other candidates who've succeeded, you're where you need to be in this subtopic. It's time to move on. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> Dr. Chandra actually <clears throat> started the course many decades ago. Um, also, he's a medical doctor super, and one of the brightest people I've ever meet, uh, met other than Roger. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so it, it's, uh, you know, you're preparing for medical license, uh, nursing, the uh, bar review. So high stakes exam prep is what they specialize in. So more than two million successful candidates in all these various disciplines. Obviously, I'm part of the UWorld uh, Accounting and Finance. I'm also a CFA charter holder. Uh, I'm also an attorney, but I don't teach their bar review. But CFA, CPA, with a way to go, it's a beautiful thing. Amazing, amazing team at UWorld. We are all on the same page at this course. We believe in uh, you know, high quality content, questions, detailed explanatory answers, but excited, enthusiastic, and sometimes you know, where appropriate, humorous lectures. Yes, we embrace that. We are not gonna just uh, um, you know, preach to you like, you know, look, this is not rocket science. None of us here are rocket scientists for sure. And I'll raise my hand, I'm definitely not. Um, but this is about, hey, you know what? How does an average person get through this exam and remember all this content? So what I really am is a professional test taker. So between the CPA, different levels of the CFA, the bar exam, you know, creative ways that you can retain this information. And sometimes when somebody, you know, imparts a little bit of humor in there, it helps. And so that's embraced. I don't get yelled at for showing my legs here. OK, so it's all good. They embrace that. Roger is a super, he guy should have been a stand up comedian. Uh, I think he tried to be an actor or a model. That didn't work out so well, as you can see his picture right here. I think he wanted to be, a, am I right about that? Did he want to be a model at some point? I think he did. But uh, there's Roger. Well, he, he, he was on a dating show back in the 70s, so that's the ah, fun. Yeah, you can Google that. Now, we were right. the dating game guy that also turned out to be a serial killer, right? There was some psycho. <laughs> <laughs> that was Roger, though, right? Put Roger in that category. <laughs> yeah, but there was somebody on that same data game, not that exact show, who turned out, I, <laughs> why am I bringing this up? What is wrong with me? But um, I just want to, you know, some of the folks here, um, you could just see the whole list of instructors, but boy, with the change in format in 2024 and them introducing different topics, a lot of the uh, IT, the SOC engagements, a lot of the tax, no longer just compliance, but the planning. You need people with industry expertise, not, 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 not people who pretend, you know, but people who've actually worked in accounting, who have done tax returns. Believe it or not, I know people that teach CPA review that have never worked in public accounting. They teach tax. They've never worked in public. They've never done a tax return for fee, for a fee. I don't even think they do their own taxes, but they're trying to pretend they're a tax expert. I don't think so. We've got real experts in all these different disciplines that, and that's why we can write the type of content that we do, the detailed explanatory answers, because you got people who live and breathe that particular subtopic, okay? So it's really a tremendous team, happy to be a part of it, um, let's see. So yeah, I think, uh, I think we're ready to go. So I'm gonna switch this up. I'm gonna put my uh, questions up there. 
Rob, can you all see my uh, screen? Yes, if I get off mute, you can hear me, yes. Beautiful, okay, so there are additional questions. Thank you to Rob for helping me uh, select these questions and put them all together. So a uh, big shout out to you, Rob, sincerely. Thank you, did an amazing job pulling these questions. These are all questions we have not worked before. Now we've got another one more uh, three hour review that's gonna be kind of cumulative, working a few new questions, but I'll be mixing in questions from the past three seminars in the last one we do. But all the questions I'm gonna do today, thanks to Rob, are all brand new that you all haven't seen before. So let's do it. You guys ready? So get your notes ready, look. If you wanna properly prepare for this exam, you cannot just watch lectures or read a textbook. You gotta engage as many senses as you can. Put the pen to the paper. What you write, you will remember. So don't just watch me do it, do it with me. So get a clean sheet of paper. You're free to take a screenshot so you can review it again later, but it's important you draw and you write these things out so you have a better understanding. I'm not gonna preach to you, memorize this, memorize that, no. I want you to understand it because the first thing you forget exam day when you get a little bit nervous is stuff you merely memorize. When you can draw it out, you really understand it, you'll be able to use it exam day. So let's do it. They tell us we have a market. Why is it always gotta be widgets? But nonetheless, the demand increases, stop right there, one step at a time. So when demand increases, folks, I'm gonna use the term, it shifts right. So my demand is gonna quote unquote, shift right. Anytime we have a shift right, that means we have an increase. We have an increase in demand. When there's a lot of demand for something, what happens to the price for that item? With all those people are looking to buy it, it's gonna go up. More demand, more quantity out there, okay? So there's just more buyers out there for whatever reason, demand is shifting right. Maybe we have more income. Maybe there's lower interest rates and I could borrow to buy more, whatever it may be, all righty? But I'm gonna have a shift right as you're gonna see. Now, second piece of the puzzle, supply not so good. Supply is decreasing. So folks, when something decreases, that means the supply is gonna shift left. Note the terminology, shift left. You'll see why that's important. So I don't know, <clears throat> maybe there was a bad weather and we didn't, weren't able to grow as many crops, whatever, but something bad happened that there's less of it. So we have a shift left in the supply. So folks, supply is down. Now what happens when there's a shortage of something? If there's still demand for it, but now there's a shortage, what's gonna happen to price? Price is gonna go up. Now, when there's a shortage, what happens to quantity? A lower quantity. What do we know for sure here? Well, they're talking, all of these choices talk about price. What do I know for sure? Whether it's demand increasing or supply decreasing, what definitely happened to price? Price went up. So it's gotta be C or D, price is gonna increase. Now the question is, what's gonna happen to quantity? Well, let's see, demand is up, so quantity is up, but supply is down, so quantity is down. So I know price is up, but quantity in one case is up, quantity in the other case is down, so I'm not exactly sure what's happened to quantity, but I do know for sure price is up, correct answer choice C. Now, how are you gonna remember this exam day? I was talking about shifting. Folks, your supply line positively sloped. Your supply line, S to the sky. Supply is up to the right, positively sloped. Demand, D in demand, D in downward sloping, a negative slope. What's your Y axis? Dollars, your price. What's your X axis? Your quantity. All righty, so now what happened in these facts? Step number one, demand shifted to the right. All righty, where was my quantity? My quantity started here. It shifted to the right. Anytime we shift right, what happens to quantity? What direction is it going? It's going up. Now, what did that do to my price? Check it out, price was here. Price started out here. Where is price now? Price went up. But that's not all they told me. They then told me that my supply shifted in what direction? to the left. So my supply line started here, that's going to the left over here, all righty. So my supply just went back to where it started. It initially increased, but now it's kind of like right back where we started. But what happened to my price again? 
no doubt about it, price went up a second time. You all see that? If you could draw it, you understand it. Anytime we shift left, quantity's going down. Anytime we shift right, quantity's going in what direction? Up. All righty, what's going to happen to price? If there's more demand, price goes up. If people don't like it, price comes down. Supply. If the supply goes up and there's a surplus, price comes down. But if supply goes down and there's a shortage, well, then that's going to drive price up, okay? So that's the way you all need to understand how to work this question. It's not about memorizing. So, folks, when we have a change in supply, a change in supply, that's going to cause a shift in the line, if you shift right, your supply is up, quantity's up, price is down. You now have a surplus, a surplus. If it shifts left, supply is down, quantity's down, you have a shortage, price now goes up. It's an ugly surplus. There's your surplus, there is your shortage. All righty, so that's a shift. If we have a change in demand, a change in demand, a shift. Well, if demand shifts right, demand is up, quantity is up. Anytime demand is up, price goes up. If it shifts left, demand is down, quantity is down, price is down. Not because you're memorizing, but because you understand. And folks, a shift, is due to something other than, due to something other than change in price of that good or service today, of that good or service today. So for example, what would cause a shift in demand? People are making more money. The economy is doing really well. Employment is up. We have more money to buy things. Interest rates are down. An expansionary monetary policy encouraging us to borrow and buy more goods with borrowed funds, okay? So at any, or your after-tax income goes up. God forbid, right? They lower the tax rate. I don't know when that's going to happen again. You all just do your taxes. I paid more taxes this year than I ever have in my entire life. And it's not due to in incremental income. It's due to that damn tax rate. Nonetheless, Change in supply, nothing to do with change in price. Not a, no change in price. The weather was really good, we grew more. The weather was really bad, we grew less, okay? Now, when you have a change in price. Hey, Pete, can I jump in for a second? Sure. Uh, we have somebody who's asking to see the graph. I believe there's a graph in the uh, answer explanation. Is that possible? Yeah. We're going to get there. All right, good. Thank you. You got a change in price of that good or service today, when you have a change in price of that good, how would they know there's a graph coming up? You're the only one that knows there's a graph coming up. Rob is so proud of his detailed explanatory answers, he wants me to show that graph. And he lied. How would they know there's a graph coming up? Come on, brother. Change in price of that good or service today. But you see, when you take pride in what you do, he wants me to show it off. Rob, I'm going to show you off. Change in price of that good or service today. Folks, then we slide along that existing line. You slide. So if prices go down, quantity demanded is going to go up. I'm going to buy more of it. But folks, if your selling price goes down, quantity supplied is going to slide down. If prices should go up, quantity demanded is going to come down. The quantity supplied will go up. Folks, this is what we mean by sliding. There's no shifting in the line. When your price goes down, quantity supplied goes up. We slide along the existing line. When price goes up, quantity demanded comes down. We slide down the existing line. No shifting. Now, Rob is so very proud. There it is, Rob. Are you happy now, Rob? I'm ecstatic. Thank you. Ah, there you go. Look at this demand line, folks. That is a shift. That's not sliding. That's a shift. That demand line shift to the right. Your supply line shifted in what direction? To the left. A shift is due to something other than a change in the price of that good or service today. All righty. If all we have is a change in price, we slide. If something happens other than a change in the price of that good or service, we shift. 
more income, lower tax rate, lower interest rates, demand will shift right. Higher taxes, you have less disposable income. GDP is down, we have less income. Unemployment is up, we have less demand, we'll shift left, okay? So shifting right, quantity up. Shifting left, quantity down. All righty, and that's the way you all are gonna draw it. There it is, nice and pretty. Now in our example, as I showed you, price started here, then price went up a second time, then price went up a third time, excuse me, a second time. So it went up two times. The quantity first went up, then it went back down. We're right back where we started to with quantity. Not sure, but price is definitely up. Okay, this is what I was mentioning, folks, our detailed explanatory answer. This is what we take time, effort, and Rob obviously takes a great deal of pride in these detailed written explanatory answers. But look, when we lecture folks, you know what we don't do? I don't read this to you. That's not how you're gonna learn. You can read this on your own. We explain step by step by step, but then nice and pretty, everything I've stated as I went through the facts and read it, well, then that's all uh, captured for you here. By the way, we also always point out key points, things to remember like, hey, what is that thing called market equilibrium? That's the point where your supply and demand intersect. That's your equilibrium quantity, your equilibrium price. If there's no government intervention, if there's no uh, um, price ceilings and there's no price floors, then this will be the equilibrium price and this will be our quantity, okay? So we always point those things out. All righty, one question down, 5,000 to go. Here we go. They want to know which of the following is not a theory that can describe uh, reasons for differences in yields that are associated with interest rates, okay? So we're looking for something that's not a theory that explains why interest rates are what they are. What dictates interest rates? A lot of that has to do with the supply the demand for loanable funds. The price of anything, like we just saw with market equilibrium, well, what's the supply and demand? Same thing with money. The supply of money, the demand for money, a lot of that's gonna dictate the interest rate, the level of the interest rate, but it's also affected by, well, what do we think our rate of inflation is gonna be? All right, so there's a variety of factors that going into determining your interest rate it is a function of number one, supply and demand for loanable funds. That is called the real risk-free rate, pure time value of money. If you're gonna lend somebody money and you gotta defer consumption to the future, you're gonna charge them for that. It's called the real risk-free rate, pure time value of money. Plus component number two, not current, but expected inflation. If I'm going to lend Rob money, then I want my money back someday, but I also want him to reimburse me for my loss of purchasing power, especially in today's environment, right? With that high inflation, you want to make sure that when you get your money back, it's going to buy what you could have bought when you first made the loan. So the value of money goes down as inflation goes up. You want to be reimbursed for that loss of purchasing power. And then the third component, risk, default risk. The risk, you may not get your money back. There are all sorts of risks, but anything that exposes you to the risk primarily that that borrower is not gonna pay you back someday, you wanna be reimbursed for assuming that risk, okay? These two components get you what's called the nominal interest rate, the nominal rate, and then when you add in the risk factor, that's your total required return, which, dis, which dictates your discount rate when you do your NPV or IRR. That dictates your required rate of return, sometimes called your hurdle rate. All righty. So now, which of these theories does not explain things about interest rate? Well, expectations theory does. Folks, if we think rates are going to be up in the future, we think rates are going to be up in the future. Well, that would explain why long-term rates are greater than short-term rates because we think rates are going to be up in the future. Why would you think rates are going to be up in the future? 
well, maybe we think rates are going to be up in the future because the government is worried about what? high inflation. They want to discourage people from borrowing money. So folks, they might look to get rates up by reducing the money supply, a contractive monetary policy, contractionary. They don't want to stimulate demand. They want to curb demand. They don't want to hurt the economy, but they got to curb this high inflation. So we think rates are going to be up in the future. Sometimes we think rates are going to be down in the future. So we think long-term rates are going to be less than short-term rates. Why would we think rates are going to be down in the future? We think there's going to be an expansionary monetary policy versus contractionary. Expansionary monetary policy, we're worried about a recession. And what can the government do to stimulate demand, increase the money supply to get rates down, to encourage people to borrow money and buy on credit? All right, what's market segmentation all about? The supply and demand for loanable funds at various segments of the market, short term, medium term, long term. Banks predominantly, they can't invest long term. They got to maintain their liquidity just in case we go to the bank and want to withdraw front funds. So they generally dabble in short term when they borrow <clears throat> short term. All right, others might say, hey, you know what? If I got to borrow, I might borrow more long-term. Lots of times companies that borrow money to buy PP&E, they're gonna be borrowing money to finance those long-term assets using long-term loans. So we dabble in different segments of the marketplace. Some lenders don't like to lend long-term. Some lenders only like to lend, lend short-term. Banks, they like the mortgages. So they're gonna do you know, maybe a fixed rate over 30 years, but there's different segments in the market that's going to dictate the rate, supply and demand for loanable funds at the short term, the medium term, the long term. That can explain interest rates. Behavioral finance theory is your right answer here. Folks, this has nothing to do with interest rates. There's something called rational economic man. That's, that's my buddy Rob here, Rob Dewey. That dude, man, he, he's like perfect ra rational economic man. He's not affected. He doesn't have any emotional, but he's kind of like Mr. Spock. He's always doing this to me when he sees me. So, he makes all his decisions calmly, rationally, it's well thought out, does his research, and then makes a decision. That is called rational economic man. Now, behavioral finance says, well, most of us are not like Rob. We don't always act rationally. We have emotional biases. When we buy, we get excited, we overbuy. When we sell, we panic, we oversell. So that does not explain interest rate, folks. That helps to explain investors how they actually behave rather than how should they behave like Rob, like Mr. Spock. All right, liquidity preference. What's that all about? There's a general thought process that, hey, most people prefer to be liquid. They're nervous when their money is tied up for longer periods of time. That's why when banks generally offer CDs, if you only lock up your money for a month or two, you're probably not going to get the same rate as when you lock up your money for nine months or a year. As a general rule, liquidity preference says long-term rates tend to be, not always, but they tend to be higher than the short-term rates. That's why when we look at the yield against term to maturity, that's why the yield curve tends to be positively sloped. Short-term rates are generally less than long-term rates. Not always, but generally. You want, to give, you want me to give up my preference for liquidity? You got to pay me for it. Now, we always show you folks, look at this beautiful thing here. We're going to tell you where you are re relative to the rest of the group. Now, only 30% of the people got this right. How could they be? Folks, you need to get this right and get it right quickly. So folks, two thirds of the people or more, 70% got this wrong. This You gotta get this right and you gotta get it right quickly. The beauty of a question like this is while you have on average a minute and a half per question, this should take no more than 10 or 15 seconds saving time for the more math intensive. All right, so behavioral finance just basically says most of us, you know, most investors, you know, we have biases and a lot of that has to do with our emotions, right? When we panic, we tend to oversell. When we get excited and we're exuberant, we tend to overbuy, et cetera. And there are other biases as well. Here's the yield curve. Now, Rob, Rob, check it out. I'm showing it. Look at this beautiful, beautiful chart, right? Positively right. sloped. 
Look at that yield curve, Rob. What does it clearly show? Short-term rates tend to be what? Less than the long-term when you're positively sloped. The long-term rates tend to be higher. But is that always the case? No. Sometimes we have cases where the yield curve is what we call, if you see the term inverted, that means the long-term rates tend to be less. So folks, positively sloped is the general rule. Negatively sloped, inverted is the exception. When do we generally think rates are going to be down in the future such that the long-term rate would be less than the short-term when we're worried about what? A recession. And then on the exam, what can the government do to prevent that? Use their monetary policy, their ability to buy and sell those government securities. So they want to get the money supply up. So if they want to get the money supply up, what side of the transaction do they want to be on when it comes to government securities? They want to buy the government securities, put more money into the economy, money supply up. When the supply of anything goes up and there's a surplus, what does that do to the price of that item? Brings it down, lower rates. Hopefully that'll stimulate demand and prevent a serious recession. Now look at this beautiful, beautiful summary of everything I just went through expectations theory that could explain interest rates market segmentation can explain interest rates liquidity preference can explain interest rates what's not going to explain interest rates behavioral finance theory here's the summary of everything we just discussed but with that being said we do not read it to you this is not about reading powerpoints that's a waste of your valuable study time i can read it on my own what I'm showing you, what Roger shows you, what our other instructors show you is real time what we're thinking about as we solve those problems. But then we always summarize it for you or Rob does and his team on the back end to make sure you have all that valuable information. Rob, do you like the way I said that, brother? Perfect. I couldn't say it better myself. So thank you very much. You got it, Robbie Dewey. All righty. Let's do another one. Ready? A client has been offered a discount. We're going way back, way back. Intro to financial accounting. When you first fell in love and said, man, I want to be an accountant. I love this stuff. A discount, 310 net 30. What the hell is that all about? Well, look, normally you have to pay me 100% of what you owe me, right? But I'm going to incentivize you to pay me more quickly. Hey, you could take a discount of 3% and then only pay me 97% of what you owe me. Why? Because I need money quickly. I, who's that commercial? J.G. Wentworth. I, I need that money now, right? I need the money now. So I'm going to say, listen, if you pay me within 10 days, hey, you know what? Take a 3% discount. All righty. So it turns out the price of that item is not 100% of whatever I sold it to you for. The price is actually only 97% of whatever that selling price was. Now, you might say, uh, you know what, Pete, I don't have the cash. Well, you know what, then if you don't pay in 10 days, you got to pay in how many? 30. 30 minus 10. How many extra days are you getting if you don't take advantage of the discount? The number of extra days are 20. You get 20 extra days if you don't take advantage of the discount. So step number one, how do we calculate the cost? Now, if this discount is offered to you and you don't take advantage of it, that's an opportunity cost to the offeree if they don't take advantage of this. And this is a very steep cost. If somebody offers you a discount, you damn well better take advantage of it. On the flip side, for the offeror, this is a very expensive way to expedite cash collections, incredibly expensive. You gotta find another way to get cash. This is probably not the way to do it. Wait till you see how this expensive this is. So this is an expense to the offeror and a potential opportunity cost to the offeree if they don't take advantage of it. All right, so you got to calculate what's called the periodic rate. That's the discount divided by the price. That's how you get your periodic rate. You then multiply that by your number of periods. Assume a 360 day year, divide that by the extra days you get if you don't take advantage of the discount. And therein lies the cost. So now it's all set up. My discount is three, my price is 97. What's my periodic rate? 
30.9, first of all, is not the right percentage, and that's not the right answer. That's the periodic rate, not the annualized rate. We're looking for the annualized cost. Then we multiply that by the number of periods, 360 divided by what's the number of extra days? 20. How many times is this happening per year? 18. What's your annualized cost? 55.62%, closest to choice C. Folks, you damn well, if this is offered to you, even if you got to borrow the money from the bank at 25%, do it because it'll save you. If you don't take advantage of this, your cost is 55. So even if you got to borrow at 25 to save 55, it's worth doing. And why would you ever offer this? This is an incredibly expensive way to get cash quickly if you're the offeror. Now, sometimes you have to do it due to competition, right? You don't have a choice, all right? So this might explain why somebody's paying their bills quickly. Now, generally, do we recommend paying your bills quickly? No, stretch it out. The only time you should pay your bills quickly is when you're incentivized to do so, like in this case. Otherwise, if they give you a 30-day grace period and no discount opportunity, take the full 30 days. Let your money sit in the bank earning interest for you or be invested elsewhere generating income for you, all right? As a general rule, you don't want to pay your bills too quickly. All right, again, we show you half the people got this question right. Now, this was math intensive, for folks, so this one's going to take a little bit longer, but that's okay because the theory questions are going to be answered in less than a minute and a half. The math intensive might take a little bit longer. This is part of a bigger puzzle, though, folks. You've got to take your number of days to sell. It's called the cash conversion cycle. Your number of days to sell plus your number of days to collect. And you calculate something called the operating cycle, the OC, the operating cycle. What's going to be very important when determining how long the operating cycle is? Your credit policy. If your credit policy is perfect, you'll minimize the operating cycle. You want that to be less than or equal to the standard. Now, if your credit policy is too strict, it's gonna take you too long to find somebody to sell it to with that high bar. You need an 800 credit rating to lend money? Forget it, you're not gonna find anybody who's credit worthy. It's gonna take you a lot longer to sell your goods, although when you do sell it, you'll collect real fast. On the flip side, you might have a very lax credit policy. You might be a nice guy like Rob, Rob doesn't even check credit rate. He lends money to everybody because he's got that kind of cash. So Rob just lends money to anybody, very lax. So he lends money for people to buy his products. He sells to everybody, sells real fast. But you know what's going to take a lot longer? For him to collect. So you don't want your credit policy to be too strict or too stri uh, lax. The optimal credit policy minimizes the operating cycle. And then, folks, you subtract your number of days to repay your vendor. Remember what I said, as a general rule, this is counterintuitive. You wanna sell quick, collect quick, you want your operating cycle to be less than or equal to the standard, but as a general rule, you don't wanna pay your bills too quickly. If you're given a 30-day grace period, why would you pay in five days? You're only gonna pay quickly if you're offered a discount. Otherwise, stretch it out. Taking a low number, subtracting a high number, that gets you what's called, oops, your net operating cycle. That gets you what's called your net operating cycle, also known as your cash conversion cycle. Cash conversion cycle. Where do we want that to be on the exam? Less than or equal to the standard. Folks, when you can generate cash quickly from your core business, that means you have no problem generating cash to pay your bills as they become due. That's an excellent sign for low financial risk. Somebody's going to have a better credit rating when they have a low cash conversion cycle, okay? So it's very important when assessing credit worthiness, et cetera. And I'll show you the formula, how to calculate all these in a little bit. That's the cliffhanger to keep you excited, but you're going to know how to calculate those. All righty. Once again, Rob and his team, beautiful. Look at how they summarized all this, right? Your numerators, your discount, 100 minus the discount, that's your price, what does that get you? Your periodic rate. And then you multiply that by your number of periods. What's your number of periods? Either 365 or 360, if they specify. Divided by, what's that denominator again? The extra days you get if you don't take advantage of the discount. So check this out. You ready? 
360, remember in our example, it was if you don't take advantage of the discount, you got to pay in 30 days. What if instead of 310 net 30, what if they tell you it's 310 net 50? No, let's make it 310 net 45. Now, instead of having 20 extra days, you now have 35 extra days. Folks, as your number of extra days goes up, what does that do to your number of periods? It makes it go down. As your number of periods goes down, what does that do to your annualized cost? It makes your annualized cost lower, lower. So folks, if you're only buying an extra 20 days, you should take advantage of that discount. But as the extra days you get to wait go up, your number of periods goes down. As your number of periods go down, your annualized cost goes down with it. Isn't that right? So that could be a good theory question. You know, people get upset. They take the CPA exam and they're like, man, some of these math intensive topics, I didn't expect them to ask it in theory. With a math intensive topic, you no, they don't always have to supply your numbers, folks. They want to make sure you really, especially the way they're changing the format of the exam, more analysis, understanding, rather than, rather than just merely memorizing and regurgitating. Can you analyze and understand? So the more days you get, that lowers that opportunity cost. Now you may forego the discount because you're like, hey, with those extra 35 days, you know what? I can keep my money invested elsewhere. All righty. Let's try another one. Take a look. <clears throat> Take screenshots. Start this one on your own. All right, wherever you may be, stop. You ready? Hopefully you didn't start up here because you have no idea what to do with all these facts. You got to start with the question stem, legalized cheating. You don't want to read the facts without knowing what to do with the facts. As soon as I see, they're looking for net present value. <clears throat> Step number one, what is my formula for net present value? Tell me what the sum of the present value of the future cash flows are going to be minus today's cost that's how we get NPV. That's nice. But in English, what the hell is NPV? Folks, it's nothing more than your profit or loss in dollars. If your NPV is pro pro <clears throat> positive, you're, gonna, you're expecting a profit. If your NPV is negative, you're expecting a loss. NPV tells you an absolute dollar is the value you'll be adding to your business, okay? So I need the present value of my future cash flows and my costs. Now I can read the facts in context ready to cherry pick the relevant information. So they tell me, Krell is considering the purchase of a new machine that has a cost of $900,000. Stop right there. First of all, drop the zero so you can move more quickly. So I just found one piece of the puzzle. My cost is 900. That's my hurdle in dollars. I'm only going to do this deal if the sum of the present value of the expected future cash flows is greater than 900. Otherwise, I don't want to do it. They tell me the new machine is going to generate cash inflow of a million, cash outflow of 700,000. This is going to be our cash flow from the operations of this machine. How long do we expect to get these cash flows? For five years. What about the net income? Folks, accrual basis net income is distractor information, no bearing on the solution. We make decisions using NPV and IRR when you do capital budgeting. Tell me about the cash. Never mind the make believe accrual basis nonsense. Do I have the cash? If I do, I'm happy. Value is based upon independent objective cash, not subjective profitability, which is dependent upon methods of accounting, accrual basis, estimates, not nah, on all that nonsense. All right, so my cash in, drop the zeros, a million. I'm expecting cash out <clears throat> to be 700. So folks, what do I think my change in cash is gonna be? A plus 300, now that's pre-tax. So I'm setting myself up. What's relevant for decision-making is not pre-tax cash flow, after-tax cash flow. I see, scan the facts, they didn't give me a tax rate, <clears throat> but I nonetheless wanna remember what's relevant is after-tax cash flow. If there's no taxes in the facts, pre-tax and after-cash tax are one and the same. If there are taxes, then you need to take, if taxes are given, 
you need to calculate what's called the dollar value of the depreciation tax shield. Even though depreciation is a non-cash expense and you would think, oh, that's irrelevant. No, it's not. If we can deduct depreciation on a tax return, that reduces your taxable income, saving you cash, increasing the cash that's in your pocket. So I would want to take my 900,000 divided by the five year life, I would want to calculate my annual depreciation and then multiply that by the tax rate to get my dollars saved. So I would want to add the dollar value of my depreciation tax shield. But in this question, there is no tax. So why the hell did I review this? Because I don't care what's in this specific question. The goal of every question is to review the rule in its entirety. If it doesn't apply in these facts, then it's just a zero. But you got to review the rule in its entirety. Okay, folks? So we're simply going to have cash flow from operations of $300,000 per year at the end of each year for five years. What's that called? An ordinary annuity. It's not a one-time payment of cash, folks. We have five payments of $300,000 per year. So I need to take that cash flow from operations, 300,000, and I need to multiply it by the present value factor of an ordinary annuity because these are annual payments. Now they tell me my required rate of return is 8%. So I need the present value factor for an ordinary annuity corresponding to five payments and a required rate of return of 8%. That 8% is your hurdle rate expressed as a yield, whereas the 900,000 is your hurdle expressed in dollars. All right. They give me the present value factor of a five-year annuity. Um, let's see. Of one, let's see, pre present value factor, uh, ordinary annuity discounted at 3.993. There's my present value factor of an ordinary annuity. They tell me also that the present value of one with an interest rate of 8% due in five years, that is distractor information. This is not a one-time payment of $300,000 five years from now. If this were a one-time payment of $300,000 five years from now, then you would take the $300,000 multiplied by 0 0.6806 to get the present value of that one-time payment. This is not a one-time payment coming in five years. This is $300,000. Whoop. This is $300,000 per year for five years. Thus, it's an annuity. So I need the 3.993. So what would that be? 1,197.9. Subtract your cost. The sum of the present value of the future cash flow, 1,197.9 minus the 900, 297.9, 297,900. <clears throat> there it lies, your NPV expressed in dollars, the value added in dollars. Now, I don't know what my IRR is. We didn't calculate that. But I can infer that since I have a positive NPV, my IRR has got to be greater than what? It's got to be greater than 8%. We can infer that. All right. So this is the thought process, how you read it. Remember, where did we start the question stem? Not the facts. You got to know what to do with the facts before you read them. Otherwise, you'll be spinning your wheels unnecessarily. All righty. Now, again, we show you, hey, you know what? 61% of the students got this right, but still quite a few got it wrong. Now, you know what else I want to show you? The present value factor of this ordinary annuity. How do you get that if that were not given information? Well, folks, step number one, you need the present value of one, a payment coming one time in five years at a discount rate of 8%. How would you do that? One divided by one plus that rate raised to the term. That's how you get the present value factor of a one time payment. So in our example, one divided by my required rate of return of 8% five years, the present value factor of a single payment coming in five years, 0 0.68058. But folks, <clears throat> that's only step one when you're finding the present value factor of an ordinary annuity. You see, that's the present value if we had a one-time payment coming in five years, but I don't. I have five payments coming each and every year. So then we go to step two. When you want to find the present value factor of an ordinary annuity, you take one minus that present value factor of one, 
and you divide it by your required rate of return. That converts it from the present value of a one-time payment to the present value factor of an ordinary annuity, 399275, 3.993 as we estimate that. That is your present value factor of an ordinary annuity. That's how it's done. All righty. <clears throat> so make sure you know which factor to use. If it's a one-time payment coming just five years from now, 300,000, you discount at 0.68. Multiple payments of an equal amount, that's an annuity. Then you got to use your present value factor of an ordinary annuity. Now, what do they call that again? If the payments start today, they begin immediately. The first payment doesn't come at the end of the year. It starts now. That's called the present value factor of an annuity. Rob, what is that called? The present value factor of an annuity? I'm sorry, I missed that question. But so I'm when the payments start today, what kind of annuity is that? I'll give you a hint. That's the present value factor of an, an annuity, and it rhymes with poo. I'm going to let you keep going, Pete. Keep going. <laughs> That's the present value factor of an annuity due when the payments start today. Come on, Rob. He's not paying attention. All he's worried about is that I show his pretty picture. Damn it. All right, are you ready? Now, a theory question. Get this. You ready? Here's the sum of the present value of the future cash flows. We know that. And an annuity, we have multiple payments coming at the end of each year, minus today's cost. There's your NPV. Folks, what if they tell you on the exam, the risk of this project is lower than typical? Then what does that do to your required return? If you're assuming less risk, then you have a lower required rate of return. Folks, as your discount rate goes down, what happens to the present value of those future cash flows? They go up. So folks, if you have a higher present value of the future cash flows, you're going to have a higher NPV. So understand the relationship between risk and present value. The lower the lit risk, the lower the discount rate, the lower the required rate of return, the higher the present value of those future cash flows. As that goes up, NPV goes up with it. Remember, if they say nothing to you on the exam, what as a general rule is your hurdle rate? As a general rule, your hurdle rate is the company's what? WAC, their weighted average cost of capital. For projects of typical risk, you generally use their weighted average cost of capital, all righty? But if this project has more risk, we gotta increase our required rate of return. If it has less risk, you lower your required rate of return. Once again, Rob and his team, they did beautiful things. Some key points about NPV that we know have been tested historically. You better take away these key points. I'll add a couple more. Remember, NPV tells you the value added in absolute dollars, folks. So that's why NPV is generally considered the best method when making capital budget decisions. It tells you in absolute dollars the value you're adding to your business. The higher the net worth, the better. And another advantage of NP NPD is like, unlike IRR, you can use multiple discount rates when calculating the present value of the future cash flow. IRR, you got to have a single hurdle rate. You can't have multiple rates, a single hurdle rate. With NPD, you can vary it. And in the real world, we call these spot rates. If you ever sit for the CFA exam and you value a bond or you value any security that's going to have payments over a long period of time, a coupon coming in six months has a higher probability of being paid and a lower risk than a payment coming 30 years from now that is not only the coupon, but includes the principal. So the beauty of NPV is that you can vary the discount rate dictated by term to maturity. And as a general rule, the further into the future you're forecasting, the higher your required rate of return. All right. When NPV is positive, we accept that project. When NPV is positive, because that means we got a profit. If NPV is negative, we got to reject that because you'd have a loss. And remember, IRR is the single discount rate that will make NPV zero. It's the single discount rate that will set the sum of the present value, the future cash flows equal to that cost. In English, IRR is the yield you're expecting given today's price and given to the, the future cash flows you're forecasting, all righty? And there it is, nice and pretty. Thank you, Rob and Rob's team. Let's go. You think I've had too much coffee today? I'm all jacked up.
Can you imagine, you know, I met Rob and he watched my videos. You know what Rob said to me when he met me? He says, Pete, you're so hyper. Tell me the truth. You got to be snorting coke when you record these videos. I said, Rob, are you kidding? How could you accuse me of such a thing? Remember that, Rob? Remember when you asked me that? I would never accuse you of such things, Pete. Oh, no, I love your enthusiasm. I don't know where it comes from, but I love your enthusiasm. He, I'm telling you. And I said, Rob, I don't snore coke, brother. I just like the way it smells. All right. So uh, let's go back to that. Um, come on. Don't get off. I'm only serious. All right. So you ready? Projects net present value. You ready? If we ignore taxes, folks, if we ignore taxes, then what does that mean? You can ignore depreciation. Folks, when we do capital budgeting, what kind of, what, what's relevant when we make our decisions? It's based upon after tax cash flows, if there's taxes. And remember, it's before financing costs. We consider the cash flows before financing costs because how I raise the capital to make that investment affects my discount rate, my weighted average cost of capital. So what's relevant is your after tax cash flows, but before financing costs. We only consider depreciation because it's a non cash expense. We only consider depreciation if there's a tax shield. The depreciation expense times the tax rate, that is dollars saved. So that is considered a cash inflow, more cash in your pocket due to the dollar value of that depreciation tax shield. Okay. Now they're telling me here, ignore taxes. All right. So a project's net present value, that's the sum of the present value, the future cash flows minus today's cost. That's how I would do NPV. And I'm going to ignore anything to do with depreciation. Now they want to know which of these is going to affect NPV. How about letter A? Proceeds from the sale of the asset to be replaced. Folks, that's a cash inflow that reduces your initial cost. How does that reduce your initial cost? Today's cost is the sum of your purchase price for that item plus the present value of any opportunity cost. If I make this investment, I got to ev evict the tenant. So the present value of that, all that foregone rental income, that makes this a higher cost. All righty. Number three, minus the net proceeds on the sale of any old equipment if I'm replacing old equipment with new equipment. So folks, if you have purchase prices and outflow, opportunity costs are an outflow, this is an inflow. So we subtract that. That reduces today's cost. That is relevant, folks. Correct answer, letter A. Now, that's nice, okay? But what do I mean by net proceeds? If we were considering taxes, if taxes were relevant, if we consider taxes, if they're relevant, it's selling price minus the net book value, there's your gain or loss. If you have a gain, multiply that by the tax rate. That's an outflow. Sorry about that, folks. That's an outflow. If you sell it at a gain, that's an outflow. If you sell it at a loss, that's an inflow. If you have a gain, the gain times the tax rate, that outflow reduces net proceeds on sale. Net proceeds on sale. If you have a loss and you multiply that by the tax rate, that's considered an inflow that increases net proceeds on sale if you sell it at a loss. All righty. So carrying value is only relevant <clears throat> if we consider taxes. Then carrying value is relevant because <clears throat> then I got to calculate my gain or loss. Carrying value is not relevant if we're ignoring taxes. And how do you get your carrying value? Your net book value, also known as your carrying value, your original cost minus accumulated depreciation, folks. So if depreciation is relevant, then you got to calculate your net book value to see when you sell that old equipment, are you selling it at a gain or loss? If you're ignoring taxes, that's irrelevant. C and D are both irrelevant because we specifically said ignore taxes. 
So if you're ignoring taxes, then you're ignoring depreciation as well. Depreciation is a non-cash expense. All right. The re relevant, <clears throat> what's relevant for decision making, is the cash in, the cash out, the incremental cash, the marginal, the amount that changes. That's relevant. Remember, some costs are irrelevant. Costs already incurred are unavoidable. The cost of a study, the cost of R&D, you ignore that. What else is irrelevant? Okay, in addition, or I should say relevant. So the cost of a study, cost of R&D, some costs are relevant. What is relevant? Something called an externality. If you add this new product line, it could cannibalize sales of another product line that's relevant for decision making, okay? So you've got to differentiate between what's relevant and irrelevant. Cash that doesn't change. It's a sunk cost. It's already been spent. You ignore. We're looking for the increase or decrease in cash. All righty. Again, we show you. How did everyone do on this questions? Half got it right. Half got it wrong. All righty. You should get this right and get it right pretty quickly. Don't forget, carrying amount is only relevant if we replace an old machine with a new machine we got to take the selling price minus that net book value, which is your cost minus accumulated depreciation. And we want to calculate our gain or loss because if you got a gain times the tax rate, that's an outflow. That's going to make your net proceeds on sale go in what direction again? Down. If, on the other hand, you sell it at a loss times the tax rate, that's an inflow. That'll make your net proceeds on the sale of the old machine go up. And the net proceeds on sale reduce your initial cost. The lower your initial cost, the higher your NPV. All right. Seen this chart before? Don't forget the relevant cash flows. Is it a one-time payment or is it multiple payments? If it's multiple payments of an equal amount coming at the end of each period, then what do we call that? An annuity. Then you want your present value factor of an ordinary annuity. All righty. We review all the things I just mentioned again about capital budgeting techniques. One of those is NPV. Remember, you can also use IRR. IRR is a relative measure of success. Are you expecting a yield greater than your hurdle rate? The problem with IRR, it does not tell you. An absolute dollar is the value you're adding to your net worth. Only NPV does that, okay? Again, we emphasize things to remember. NPV, a lot of times when you replace an old machine with a new machine, cash goes up because you've got a savings for more efficient equipment. So it's not that it maybe produces more units and gives you higher sales. That might be part of it. But many times a new airplane will be more fuel efficient than an old airplane from 30 years ago. The airlines have to consider, well, hey, the reduction in what we pay for fuel, that's considered a cash inflow. All righty. Woo, baby, I feel like I'm giving birth to a CPA. Let's go. All righty, make a flashcard with me. You ready? Materials variances. I don't care what they're asking here. How do you do materials variances? Anytime you see material variance and you're practicing, I want you to immediately set it up. How? Actual quantity purchased at the actual price. Take that actual quantity purchase and compare it to the standard price. That's how you're going to get your price variance, folks. All right, that's how you get your price variance. Hopefully what we pay is less than what we thought we were going to pay. But remember, sometimes you get what you pay for. You buy cheaper, you know, you hire somebody who's cheaper maybe to teach something. Maybe you get what you pay for, right? You want quality, it costs. Isn't that right, Rob? That's why we pay Rob as much money as we do. And then you take your actual quantity used at the standard price, and we compare that to the standard quantity allowed at the standard price. Folks, that's your efficiency variance, utilization. You buy cheap stuff, you might have to use more of it. Now, how do you calculate standard quantity allowed? Standard quantity allowed. How do you calculate that? Actual output Actual production times the standard allowed, the materials, the standard allowed per unit. So folks, if I'm taking the exam, first thing I want to do, set this up. I'm ready to answer any question they ask. In an individual multiple choice, it might be just one piece of the puzzle. In a task-based simulation, you could expect to have to do all the pieces of the puzzle. All right, so here we go. 
They tell me the standard direct material cost to produce one conference table is four meters is the standard quantity allowed for, and the standard cost is 250. I put that 250 everywhere I need a standard price, I put the 250. Okay, during May, 4,200 meters of material costing 10,080 was purchased, and not only did they purchase that, but they used it. So the actual quantity purchased, I put that everywhere, 4,200. And not only was it purchased, I used it all as well. Sometimes you don't use everything you purchase. Be careful, all right? So you gotta make sure. Here, we used and purchased the same amount. Now, what's the actual number of tables we produced? A 1,000. A 1,000, we should have used four meters of material per table, 1,000 tables, standard quantity allowed is 4,000. Stop right there. We actually used 4,200. We should have only used 4,000. So folks, the actual, sorry about that. The actual quantity used is greater than the standard quantity allowed. This is gonna be unfavorable, all righty, unfavorable. Now, what did those 4,200 uh, uh, meters cost us? Well, let's say um, they tell us $10,080. So what we actually spent was 10,080. What should we have spent for 4,200? 4,200 times 250? 10,500. Now notice, they didn't give me my actual price per unit. No problem. Take the 10,080 you actually spent on the 4,200 meters you actually purchased. What's that a price per meter? I can infer that that is $2.40 less than what I thought I was going to pay. So folks, this is a $420 favorable price variance. And that's what they want, the price variance. Now you're saying to me, Pete, well, why are you doing also the, the efficiency? Because I don't know what the hell they're going to ask exam day. So we use the question to review the rule in its entirety. All right. That's why I don't just read the detailed explanatory answer because I go beyond the scope of that. We want to make sure you understand the big picture. All righty. 4,200 actual quantity used times the standard price of 250. Again, 10,500. We should have, though, only used 4,000 meters of material to produce those thousand tables. So folks, we actually spent more than we should have. That's unfavorable. So my usage variance is 500 unfavorable. That's your usage variance. Now, what's your net variance? Since anytime you use everything you purchase, you can net it out. You can only net out, again, you can only net out your material variances when you purchase and use the same amount. Since we did that here, well, look, you saved $420, you bought cheaper stuff, but then you had to use a lot more of it. So overall, you are penny wise and dollar foolish. Don't be cheap. When you hire your instructors, make sure they actually worked in public accounting. They've done a tax return for a fee. They've actually worked in audit. They've done audit engagements. They've done a SOC engagement. How are they gonna teach you something they never did? But that's gonna cost more money, right? You world don't mind paying that. Trust me, I know. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, so $80 is your overall, but they didn't ask about that, folks. That's not what they asked here. All right, but nonetheless, we reviewed it. All right, so how many people did this right? A lot of our people did this right. That was great. All right, now, I don't know what they're gonna ask you exam day, so let's continue your flashcard, you ready? Two for one, two for one. How do you do labor variances and variable overhead variances? The setup is exactly the same so long as the cost driver is direct labor hours. So long as your cost driver for the overhead is direct labor hours, you set it up the exact same way. And it almost always, when you do these long problems, your cost driver for overhead will be direct labor hours. So your setup is exactly the same. Although your inputs are going to differ, what you pay your laborers is different than your variable overhead, okay, which we're going to see in a second. But nonetheless, if we're doing labor or variable overhead, not materials, how do we do it? Actual hours times the actual rate, actual hours times the standard rate, standard hours allowed at the standard rate. This gets you 
your price variance or spending variance, your rate or spending variance, depending upon whether it's labor or overhead, your rate or spending variance. The difference between the actual hours and the standard hours allowed, what does that get you? Well, that's your efficiency variance. That is your efficiency variance. How do you get your standard hours allowed? Again, your standard hour, not material, standard hours, but you do it the same way. Standard hours allowed, take your actual output times the standard hours per unit, per unit, all righty? That's how you get your standard hours allowed. Now, your actual rate versus your standard rate for labor is really easy. How do you get your standard rate, your overhead rate, when you're doing a traditional costing system? Well, we assign all overhead to products based upon a single cost driver. In a traditional system, we use a single cost driver, usually direct labor hours, okay? It could be something else, but that's generally what it is. So you're going to take your budgeted variable overhead, divide that by your budgeted direct labor hours, assuming that your cost driver there's your variable overhead rate. Traditional costing system, we only have a single overhead rate. That's how you get your standard rate for, for a variable overhead. If it's fixed overhead, how do we do fixed overhead? For fixed overhead, you take your budgeted fixed overhead, continue your flashcard, budgeted fixed overhead, in <clears throat> divided by your, again, assuming your cost driver, is direct labor hours, budgeted, total direct labor hours. There's your fixed overhead rate that we apply overhead, okay? <clears throat> How do you do your fixed overhead, what's known as the volume variance? Fixed overhead is known as the volume variance. For variable overhead, we have the spending and efficiency for variable overhead. Just to go back here, it's the spending and efficiency. All righty, same thing for labor. But for fixed overhead, it's called a volume variance. How do you get that? Tell me your actual production, your actual production minus your budgeted production, how many units you thought you were going to make, your budgeted production. Multiply that by that standard fixed overhead rate, that standard fixed overhead rate, and that gets you your fixed overhead, also known as your volume variance. All right, so now you know how to do any variance they give you exam day. You're ready to go. All right, now materials variance everything you wanted to know about the materials variance again we summarize it for you again nice and neat what are the key points all righty so i showed you how to set it up but you got it all right there as well okay let's try another one question number seven how are we doing on time time is flying you got to be kidding me time is flying Woo, baby all right Ready? Take a screenshot. Let's see what we got. We got to allocate joint cost to joint products. Stop right there. We do not allocate joint cost to buy products. We do not allocate joint cost to buy products. I'll talk about the buy products, the incidental in just a second. We, are, we have to allocate the joint cost to the main products, the products we set out to manufacture. There are three methods to allocate joint cost to joint products. What are the three methods? Let's review that. How do we allocate joint cost? Now, what's a joint cost, Rob? What's a joint cost? Don't tell me, because I know you grew up in the 60s, the cost of a joint. It's not the cost of marijuana, got nothing to do with that, Rob. Joint cost, we're talking about all costs up to the split off point. The joint cost is also known as a common cost. It's all your cost all your costs up to the split off point where the pot products go in different directions. All righty, all costs up to the split off point. It's also known as common costs. Three ways we can allocate those joint costs to our various products. 
we're going to allocate it on a pro rata basis. It could be done based upon volume produced. It could be based upon sales value at split off. If that's known, if that's not known, then we use relative sales value. We infer it. We take our sales value. We take our sales value and we subtract from that the separable cost, the cost after the split off point. We get, we infer the relative value at split off. We infer it when that's not given information. Okay. That's what they're talking about here. We're going to take our sales price at the point of sale, all our sales revenue, back out all the costs after the split off point. That's again called your separable cost. So folks, in this example, how are they allocating it? Relative sales value at split off. They're inferring what the relative sales value is at split off by taking the final sales value. You gotta finish it to sell it. In the real world, folks, most partially completed products, work in process, don't have a value unless you finish it. What are you going to do if a chair has only three legs? There's not much you could do with that chair, right? You need all four legs. So we got to finish it to sell it. So then you take your final sales value, you back out the separable cost, we infer what the relative value would be at split off, okay? And then you could allocate based upon that method. Okay. What are, what's your selling price, Normus? My, <laughs> I'm a little bit too excited, Rob. You take your sales price and you subtract out your normal profit. What's the difference between your selling price and your profit? That's a way to back into what? Your costs. Selling price minus your profit, therein lies your total cost. All right, that's not what we have here. Final sales value minus the cost after the split off, the separable cost, that's relative sales value, okay? Total cost is the sum of your joint cost plus your separable costs. Joint costs are all the costs up to the split off point. Separable costs are the costs after the split off point. All right, now I'm gonna ask you a question, you ready? What if I told you I want a profit margin of 30%? I want a profit margin of 30%, okay? We're gonna do what's called cost, plus pricing. I want a profit margin of 30%. Here's your given information, you ready? Total costs, your separable, plus your joint costs are 250. Those are your total costs. You ready? I want a profit margin of 30%. What should your selling price be? So what should the selling price be? What should Selling price B. There's a couple of ways of determining that. Take a second, set it up. You ready? How would we do this? Did you get an answer? Rob, did you get an answer? What would your selling price be? If you want a 30% profit margin and your costs are 250, what would your selling price be, Rob? He's like, if you ask me another question, Peter, I'm going to find you and stab you. Rob, I'm sorry. I'll leave you alone. You ready? This is the way I would do it. If my selling price is 100% and I want a profit of 30%, that means my costs are what? My costs are 70% of my selling price, obviously, right? Now, what is my cost? You ready? If I want a profit of 30 and I know my costs are 250, you ready? What are my costs as a percentage of my, uh, look, let's do it this way. What, here, let me write it down. What is my profit as a percentage of my cost? All righty. 
So we know our costs are 70% of your selling price. I want to know what my profits are as a percentage of my cost. So my profits are 30. My costs are 70. My profit is 30%. My cost, 70%. What's 30 divided by 70? My profit is what percentage of my cost? That's approximately 43%, agreed? Your profit, if that's 30 and your cost is 70, then your profit as a percentage, not of your selling price, but your profit as a percentage of your cost is 43%. So my selling price, I'm just gonna switch this here. My selling price is equal to my cost plus my profit. My cost is 250. My profit as a percentage of cost, profit is 30, cost is 70, that's 43%. So my profit is therefore 43% of my cost, which is 250. What's 43% of 250? That's approximately 107.5. Your profit is a percentage of cost. So 250, that's an ugly 250. 250 plus 107.5, what would our selling price have to be? 357.5. Now that's the way PhDs do it, all righty? They know all these formulas. Is there another way to do it that might be a little bit more intuitive? That might be a little bit more intuitive, yeah. Same result, different format. Let me show you an alternate approach to calculate your selling price, alternate approach. Again, step number one, we know our selling price, 100%, our cost is 70, our profit is 30%. What was given in this these facts? I know my cost is 250. Simple algebra, folks. You ready? My cost is equal to 70% of my selling price. That's another way to come up with your selling price, right? My cost is 70% of my selling price. All righty. Since my cost is given information, all we got to do is simple algebra. Divide both sides by 70%. 250 divided by 70%, what's your selling price got to be? 357.5. Same result, different format, which might be a hell of a lot more intuitive. If you're not given your selling price, but you are given your cost, you've got different ways to come up with cost plus pricing. You could do it this way. Just got to get your profit as a percentage of your cost. And since our cost was given information 250, my profit's got to be 43% of that 250. But that's less intuitive than simply saying, hey, my cost is 70% of my selling price. They told me I want a profit margin of 30%. I got a cost of 250. Well, if your profit's 30%, then your cost is 70. So 250 is 70% of your selling price. Divide both sides by 70%, same result, different format. Now, another way to come up with this, all this deep, all this different information. You ready? Um, and, and before I do that, I want to point out that relative sales value at split off again is your total sales revenue. Your total sales revenue, which is your selling price per unit times the number of units minus not your total cost, but your separable cost. That's step one. You then get your relative sales value for each product, total it, get the relative sales value for that one product, and that's how we will allocate our joint cost to the various products, okay? So that is our pro rata allocation. So you'd have to get your relative sales value at split off for each product the company produces then get the total amount that becomes your denominator then your numerator is the relative sales value for that one product and that's the percentage of the joint cost whoops that is the percentage of joint cost allocated to that product 
allocated to that product. Okay, folks, I want to remind you of something I mentioned a second ago. A byproduct is a minor product, also known as an incidental product. It has a minor value. It's not what we set out to manufacture. We had some materials left over. Rather than throwing it out, we made this byproduct. You do not allocate joint costs. Do not allocate joint costs to byproducts. Do not allocate joint costs to the byproducts, only the main products. So what do we do with the revenue generated by pro byproducts? You sell the byproduct, you get some revenue. We could either record that as miscellaneous revenue. You could take the revenue from the byproducts and record it as miscellaneous revenue on the income statement, or you can use by product revenue to offset the joint costs that have to be allocated to the various individual products. So that's another thing you could do with the by product revenue. Use it to and offset, reduce the joint costs that have to be allocated to the individual products. Okay, so that's what you should read carefully. Joint costs only get assigned to the byproducts. <laughs> Joint costs only get assigned to the main products, not the byproducts. Okay, the by byproducts, you know, it's minor. When they call it minor or incidental, it's merely uh, uh, incidental revenue. Okay, so the things to remember that definition, relative sales value, that's one of the three ways of allocating the joint costs to the main products. All righty, how do we do it? Total final sales value, it's your final sales value if you finish it, minus the separable cost to finish it. There's your relative value at split off, total that all up for all the individual products and allocate the joint cost to those individual products on a pro rata basis. All righty, let's try another one. You ready, where do we start? The question stem. What is the estimated cost for handling 75,000 kilos of this product? What's the estimated cost? You ready? Handling costs. This is like part of our overhead, right? Remember, the traditional costing system assigns overhead to products usually based on one factor, volume. Okay, volume, which is a way to do it but it's not the most sophisticated way. The more sophisticated way to assign overhead to individual products is using activity-based costing, where we look at multiple overhead rates, given multiple cost drivers. What's driving the overhead in department one might be different than what's driving the overhead in department two. Activity-based costing, multiple cost pools, multiple cost drivers results in multiple overhead rates. Traditional, we, we say, hey, we'll assign all overhead to products based upon one cost driver for simplicity, and normally that's volume. Okay, that's simple regression. When you only have one independent variable, that's simple regression. That's simply y equals a plus bx, whereas y is your dependent variable, x is your independent variable, normally volume. This is your y-intercept, your fixed cost, independent of volume, your fixed costs, and then your slope. That's your variable cost on a per unit basis, all righty? So we use that by saying total cost is a function of your total fixed cost plus your variable cost per unit times your quantity, your volume, your output, all righty? Variable cost per unit times your quantity, that is your total variable cost. Folks, again, we love the visualization, but let's set it up together. What is this point right here? That's called your y-intercept. This is your dependent variable, your total cost in dollars. Folks, this is your total fixed cost right there. That's called your y-intercept. Even if I produce nothing in the short run, and your independent variable is your quantity. That's your x-axis. Even if I produce nothing in the short run, you got your total fixed cost. So remember, if a product's a loser, you don't necessarily want to shut down immediately if you got a loss because you're still going to incur those fixed costs, the rent, 
the insurance, the depreciation, whether you produce these units or not, in the short run, most fixed costs are unavoidable. Remember that from last time, most fixed costs are unavoidable. That's why you don't necessarily immediately shut down if you have a loss. So long as your sales are greater than your variable costs, then what are we producing? Contribution margin that can be used to do what? Offset those fixed costs. So you don't want to immediately shut down. So this here is my total fixed cost, independent of quantity, all righty, independent of quantity. Now, this region is my total variable cost, your variable cost per unit times your quantity. Take your total variable plus your total fixed, there's your total cost, all righty. Now, watch how sophisticated I get. Look at this, Rob taught me this. Now I can change colors. Thank you, Rob. What's that line where your y-intercept is zero? That's your sales line, folks. That's your sales line. You don't sell anything, you're not going to have any revenue. Where your sales line intersects your total cost line, what's that? That is your break-even point, folks. That's how many units I have to produce to just break even. That's your break-even in units. Here's your break-even in sales. All righty. To anything you produce less than that, you're a loser. You're to the right of that, you're a winner. You got a profit. All righty. Now, how do we find the pieces of the puzzle? How do you find your total fixed cost? How do you find your variable cost per unit? Well, one way to come up with the inputs is to use what's called the high-low method. The high-low method is a way to determine, step one, your variable cost per unit, and then step two, your total fixed cost. All righty, so it's called the high-low method. So folks, with the high-low method, you ready? I'm just gonna move here. What's your high level of activity? Activity level number one, there's your high. We got more units, we got more costs. What's our low level? The two, lower quantity, lower costs. So obviously costs are affected by quantity. The kilos handle, all right? So this is your cost driver. The kilos handle, obviously as that goes up, Total cost goes up with it. So folks, step number one, change in your dependent variable divided by the change in your independent variable. That gets you your slope, also known as your variable cost per unit in this regression model. So that is this variable here, okay? When you have a change in your independent variable, what is the change in your dependent variable? That is your slope, your measure of sensitivity. Every time I handle more units, how much does my cost go up by? So folks, I take my high level minus my low med, uh, um, my high level minus my low level. Now, what's your numerator? Your change in your total cost, that's the dependent variable, all righty? Your change in quantity, that's your independent variable. Cost is dependent upon quantity. So I take my high cost, 160, minus my low cost. Drop your zeros, folks, so you can move more quickly. Your numerator is 28. Your quantity, your high quantity, 80, minus your low quantity, 60. Change in quantity, that's 20. 28 divided by 20. What is your variable cost per unit? 1.4. There is my variable cost per unit. Step one is complete. You now have your variable cost per unit. Step two, you now back into your total fixed cost. You back into total fixed cost. Use the high level. Why high? Because I like to get high. I get high on CPA review. So my total fit, my total costs are a function of my total fixed cost plus my variable cost per unit times my quantity. All righty. We already know our variable cost per unit is 140. I'm going to use the high level of activity. I know my total cost is 160, drop the zeros. And I know my quantity at the high level of activity is 80. That's my quantity at the high level of activity. Agreed? All righty. What's 80 times 1.4? 80 times 1.4 is 112. That is my total variable cost. So if your total cost is 160 and that's made up of variable costs, then we can infer since my variable cost is 112, what's my fixed cost got to be? It's got to be 48. You now have solved for your simple regression model.
you have one independent variable quantity. Now we can use this formula for any quantity you want to give me. So from here on in, total cost is a function of my total fixed cost, 48, plus my variable cost per unit times any level of quantity you want to give me, dropping to zero. So you can move more quickly and input in your calculator faster. So quantity of 75, let's now input that. 75 times 1.4, what's my total variable cost? My total variable cost, 105. That is my total variable cost. What's my fixed cost? 48. Add it together, 153. And then you pray, is that an answer choice? Whoop, there it is. 60% of people got that wrong. High-low method, you love this stuff. It's a simple regression model where we back into our slope, our variable cost per unit, by using the change in the dependent variable, change in total cost, relative to the change in the independent variable quantity. Every time we handle more, total cost goes up. That's why many times in a traditional costing system, we use a simple regression model, because a lot of times that overhead is driven by volume, whether it's hours or in this case, it's handling quantity, whatever it is, okay? Now, high-low method again, step number one, what do we need? Your variable cost per unit, which is synonymous with what? Slope, change in your dependent variable cost divided by your change in independent variable. Once you have that, you move on to step two. What do we do in step two? We back into total fixed cost using the high level of activity. What's the total cost? What's the high level of activity that gets you that high total cost? You now know your variable cost per unit. That is per step one so that we could back into what our fixed cost is. All right, folks, a traditional costing system. In a traditional costing system, we use simple regression. Simple regression one independent variable. There's only one independent variable driving your cost. Okay, one cost driver. That's simple regression, one independent variable. Normally, there's one cost driver when we assign overhead, one cost driver. It's probably total hours or volume, okay, whatever it may be, weight, in this case, kilos, whatever, okay, traditional costing system. Activity-based costing is a more sophisticated way to assign overhead to your various products. With activity-based costing, we have multiple cost pools. We don't take the cost for all overhead. No, 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 that's one cost pool. We're gonna take the cost in each and every department, and then we're gonna figure out, well, hey, what's the cost driver in that department? So we have multiple cost pools, multiple cost pools drivers. We try to figure out, hey, in this department, it's the weight of the product. In this department, overhead is driven by machine hours. In this department, maybe overhead is driven by labor hours. But you have multiple cost pools, multiple cost drivers, and thus you have multiple overhead rates. Now you will assign your overhead to each and every product based upon how much that product uses of the resource in that particular department. Folks, you have multiple cost drivers, you have multiple independent variables. This is a multiple regression model. This is how we predict the overhead that we're forecasting, given what we're forecasting. The overhead in this department, well, let's forecast the amount of labor hours. The overhead in department number two, we got to forecast the machine hours. The overhead in department number three, we got to forecast the number of kilos or pounds. All right. And then the total overhead is a function of those multiple independent variables driving the costs in those multiple departments. That's multiple regression. It's a more sophisticated way, a more accurate way of assigning overhead to those various products. Because remember, overhead by definition is an indirect cost. It's your indirect material, your indirect labor. It's all the costs associated with operating the factory, the depreciation in the factory, rent, insurance. We don't know those actual numbers you know, until the end of the period. But during the period, we have to assign costs to the very various products we manufacture. So don't forget, folks, your overhead T account. With your overhead T account, 
What's on the debit side? Your actual overhead. What's on the credit side? Your apply, your estimated overhead. All right. Anytime you have a debit balance, that means unfavorable, bad news. The actual amount must have been greater than what you estimated. If you have a credit balance in that account, that's good. That means the actual turned out to be less than what you forecasted, what you applied. All right. Applied is a fancy word for estimating during the period, the overhead that we have to assign to the various products so that we could come up with the cost of our inventory during the month, during the quarter, during the year, whatever it may be. OK, there it is for you. Nice and pretty. Folks, I want to talk about a mixed cost. We talk about variable costs. We talk about fixed. Costs. What are examples of variable costs? Variable costs tend to be things like what? Direct materials direct labor, utilities, commissions. Those are your traditional variable costs. What are your fixed costs? Things like what? Rent, depreciation, maybe somebody's base salary, all right? They might get a bonus depending upon output, the base amount, okay? That would be a, a fixed cost. Insurance is generally a fixed cost, et cetera. But sometimes you have what's called a mixed cost. There's a variable and a fixed component. Folks, in the real world, utilities, 100% of that bill is normally not variable. It's not. Why not? Because if you ever go away on vacation for a month, don't use your electric. You're still going to have a bill. Why? Because your utility bill has a fixed monthly charge, whether you use it or not. And then there's another part that's based upon usage, the flat monthly fee, even if you don't turn your lights on you're still gonna have a utility bill. So in the real world, it's not so simple fixed variable. Many times an individual cost has a fixed component as well as a variable. Salaries, Rob's salary, three million a year is his base. And then he gets a bonus by having these beautiful pictures and stuff like that. Dr. Chandra likes that stuff. For every picture he puts in, he gets an extra thousand dollars. That's the variable amount. So total compensation normally has a base and a variable component. All right. Let's try another one. Rob, I'm sorry. I apologize if I understated your income, Rob. Apologize. I'm getting a good laugh out of it. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> I'm, I, you know, I can, I can speak in terms of uh, fractions of that. So, okay, thank you. <laughs> hey, by the way, folks, our 2024 beautiful, shiny, brand new product featuring Roger, myself, and all these other wonderful instructors. It's coming out at the end of this month. That's right. Don't be scared. October 31st, not only Halloween, we are releasing our 2024 product. And Rob got a huge bonus for getting that product out on time. And therefore, he is taking us all. You got to look, look at my team at UWorld. Rob is taking us all on an all expense paid trip to South Beach because we're getting that product out on time. You world, you got to love it. They know how to treat their people. All right. Now, you ready? Number nine, where are we going to read? Don't start up here. Where are we going to start? We want to know what's the budgeted cost for the coming year if we were to operate seven sales offices. So I'm thinking total costs are going to be a function of the total fixed cost plus the variable cost per office times the number of offices. The number of offices, that's your independent variable. Total cost is my dependent variable. Total fixed cost is my y-intercept. That variable cost per office is my slope. Change in my total cost given the change in the number of offices. In the number of offices. All right, so now I set it up. They tell me we have total costs for five sales offices, total costs were 500,000, stop right there. Total fixed costs, the variable cost per office times the number of offices. Okay, now I could start filling in folks. They said we have a total cost of 500,000 when we operate five offices. I've got one piece of the puzzle, okay. 70,000 of that was a fixed cost. You could drop the zeros, I'll leave them in. 70,000. How are we going to come up with our variable cost per unit to finish our simple regression model? Well, folks, if you know your total cost is 500 and the total fixed cost is 70, 
then for five offices, what must have been the total variable cost? The total variable cost must have been 430. So the variable cost per office, the variable cost per unit times five equaled what amount? $430,000 for those five offices. So my total variable cost, 430, divided by my number of offices, five, what must be the cost per office? You see how we can manipulate the formula? Here, we're backing into the cost per office must have been 86, $86,000. So now I've got my variable cost per office, $86,000. Got it? Now I can set up my simple regression model. From here on in, I can predict total cost for any number of offices. So from here on in, total cost is my total fixed cost, 70,000, plus my cost per office, 86,000, times my independent variable, my number of offices. What did they say the number of offices? Let's now make that seven. So what is seven times $86,000? Well, that's 602. 602, that's my total variable cost, 602. 602 plus 70, $672,000, $672,000. Now I'd like to make Rob happy, because he's taking me on vacation, South Beach, because we got that product out on time. What does this look like in terms of a regression model? You ready? Here's my quantity, my number of offices. Here's my total cost, my y-axis. Folks, what did we say our total fixed cost was? $70,000. Whether you have no offices or you have 20 offices, you're going to have $70,000. Now, that's called a relevant range. Assuming the relevant range is anywhere between 20 and 70, uh, excuse me, 20, uh, zero and 20 offices or whatever number that is out there, there's your quantity. Now, how do we calculate our variable cost? Total variable cost, $86,000 times your number of offices. And that's how we get our total cost line. Our slope is the change in the quantity, right? Change in quantity, your independent variable. change in the number of offices, change in total cost, right? Fixed cost remains constant. Now, Rob, look at these beautiful pictures. What do we, if they gave you this picture on the exam, how would you know we're looking at variable costs? Because as quantity goes up, total cost is going up, right? Volume is your independent variable, cost is your dependent variable, positively sloped. The more offices you have, the higher your cost. However, my variable cost per unit, $86,000 per office is constant. Per office, that is constant. So folks, when it comes to variable cost, the per unit cost is constant. The total varies with output. All righty. Now, total fixed cost, your Y-intercept, whatever it was, $70,000 in the relevant range, that total fixed cost does not change. This is my relevant range. All righty, you're gonna have costs, $70,000. Okay, base salary, rent, depreciation, insurance, whatever. But notice something, folks. Your fixed cost per unit has a negative slope. Don't memorize, understand. Total fixed cost divided by quantity. This is called capacity utilization. What you world is getting out of me, the more lectures I record, what happens to that cost per lecture? It goes down. That fixed cost per unit goes down. So that has a negative slope. And that is the that's a function of capacity utilization. This is why the Walmarts of the world, the Home Depots, the Lowe's push out the mom and pop hardware stores. Capacity utilization right? They buy in such mass quantity that they normally get a lower cost per unit for what they buy because they buy in such mass volume, right? So whenever you have the opportunity to take advantage of economies of scale because you're larger, you're generally going to have a lower cost per unit because you're spreading it out over more units, you can generally get a lower cost per unit. 
All right, folks, we summarize everything I just went through, variable costs, fixed costs, total costs, how the formula works, things to remember, what are variable costs per unit constant, total varies, fixed costs in total remains the same, the fixed cost per unit goes down as quantity goes up, a negative slope, okay? Put the pen to the paper, you're gonna be in good shape. All righty, we are rocking and rolling, baby. We are on our way to passing BEC. Yeah, you know me. Take a second, screenshot, and then work it. Number 10. Ready? They want to know, Dell Company has fixed cost of 100,000, break even point of sales of 800,000. Stop right there. What immediately comes to mind when you see break even point? How do you get break even point? Make your flashcard with me. Take your total fixed cost. If you divide that by your contribution margin as a percentage of sales, that gets you your break even in sales dollars. Conversely, or if you take your total fixed costs and you divide it by your contribution margin per unit, that gets you your number of units that you have to sell to break even. Everybody with me on that? What is contribution margin again? Your sales minus your variable costs is your contribution margin. You could either do that as a percentage of sales Contribution margin divided by your sales as a percentage or per unit. If you're given per unit information, then you can do it per unit. All right, so step number one, you got to know your formulas. All right, they tell us we've got fixed costs of 100,000. We got break even sales of 800,000. What is the projected profit at a million two? I'm going to show you method one of two on how to solve this. The first method I'm gonna show you now is intuitive. It's not a memorized formula, okay? Once you know your basics, hey, my total fixed costs are what amount? 100,000, drop the zeros. My break-even sales, a million two. I can now solve for what my contribution margin must be as a percentage of sales. Let's solve for that denominator. So take 100 divided by a million two. You ready? 100 divided by. Oh, I'm sorry, folks. My break even sales are 800,000, not a million two. We're looking for our projected profit at a million two, sales of a million two. My bad. So take 100 divided by 800, solve for X. You ready? What's my contribution margin have to be as a percentage of sales? That's 12.5%. So we know our total fixed costs are 100. We know our break even sales are 800,000. 100 divided by 800. My contribution margin percentage is 12.5. You ready? So selling price, sales, 100%, minus your variable costs. That gets you your contribution margin. So, folks, whatever your sales are, 12.5% is left over to cover your fixed costs. So that means 100 minus 12.5. How much must go towards variable costs? 87.5% must go towards variable costs. Agreed? Okay, so step two. We know we have sales here of a million two. Dropping the zero zeros. My variable cost is 87.5% of that sales level of a million two. What's 87.5% of a million two? That's a million fifty. That gets me contribution margin. What I have left over to cover fixed costs of 150. All righty. They gave me my fixed costs. If your fixed costs are then 100, What's left over for profit? 50,000 is left over for profit. Your contribution margin in dollars is 150. That's not your profit. Contribution margin is what you have available to cover your fixed costs. All righty. So knowing that my break even sales are 800, and by the way, you could always check yourself. Sales of 800. 
minus your variable cost, 800 times 0.875. That gets you your contribution margin, what you have left over, 12.5% of 800. Okay, you can always double check your numbers if you're concerned, okay, that you're getting these things right. All right, but obviously, if 87.5% is going towards your variable cost, 12.5% of 800, that's going towards covering your fixed costs. All righty. Now, I want you all to take a look at another approach. We're going to call this method two of two. What's another way of doing this? Folks, another way of doing this, and I'm actually going to slide over here, method two of two. Another way of doing this is what's called your cost volume profit analysis formulas. Okay, it's faster, but not necessarily as intuitive. Take a look at this in sales dollars. If you take your fixed cost plus your target profit and you divide it by your contribution margin percentage, that tells you what your sales have to be to get that target profit. All righty, that tells you what your sales have to be to get that target profit. All righty, so this is another way of doing it, but less intuitive. You got to know the formula, but not a big deal. We know our fixed costs are 100. Okay, we know our fixed costs are 100. We don't know what the profit is. We don't know. Okay, but we do know our contribution margin is 12.5%. We also know our sales are a million two. We also know our sales are a million two. So now we just have to do some simple algebra. You ready? Let's multiply both sides of the equation times 1.25, 0.125. Let's multiply both sides of the equation. What are we left with? Fixed costs of 100 plus your target profit. What's 12.5%? of a million two and that's a tp a million two times 12.5 percent is 150. subtract your fixed costs from both sides subtract the fixed costs from both sides what would our profit level be with sales of a million two what would our profit be 50. Same result, different format, but a little bit less intuitive. If you remember the formula, great. This is number of units, your total fixed costs plus your target profit divided by your contribution margin on a per unit basis. That tells you what your sales have to be, your number of units sold, what your sales have to be in units to get that target profit, okay? That tells you in units. Now, I just wanna go back for a second. Folks, I wanna draw this out for you. You ready? Our fixed costs, our total fixed costs are $100,000, agreed? What's our break-even point? Well, there's our fixed costs. Here's my total cost line, okay? My total variable cost, sales, Minus your variable costs, your contribution. Your sales are 100%. All righty. We know our contribution margin. We know our contribution margin, 12.5%. So that means our variable costs are 87.5% of our sales. Okay, 85.7%, 87.5% of our sales. So total variable costs, 87.5% of your sales, that's how you get your total costs. Okay, your sales line always has a y-intercept of what? Zero, there's your sales line. Here's our break-even sales. Break-even sales, $800,000, $800,000, that's your break-even sales. Okay, now I don't know my quantity. I don't know my number of units. I want to assume, you ready? Let's assume, I'm making this up, a selling price per unit. Let's make that 50 bucks. Your selling price per unit is 50. Okay, if you know your break even sales, given information, if you know your break even sales are $800,000, 
and your selling price per unit is 50, 16,000 units have to be sold. 16,000 units have to be sold to just break even. Okay, 16,000 units have to be sold to just break even. All righty. Now, selling price on a per unit basis, well, if that's 50 and your variable costs are 87.5% of sales, what's 87.5% of 50? 87.5% of 50, my variable costs on a per unit basis, $43.75. That means my contribution margin on a per unit basis is $6.25, $6.25. Folks, if your fixed costs are $100,000 and my contribution margin on a per unit basis is $6.25, how many units do I have to sell to just break even? 16,000 units. That's your break even, but in units, not dollars. Here's your break even in sales dollars, 800,000. There's your break even in units, 16,000 units, okay? But everything was predicated upon backing into my contribution margin as a percentage of sales. Again, how did we do that? Total fixed costs divided by your contribution margin, your break even sales. This was given information, 800,000. Total fixed costs, 100,000 was given information. So we solve for the denominator, 100 divided by 800, my contribution margin, 0.125. That's how we got our contribution margin as a percentage of sales. And then check yourself, is 100 divided by 1.25, is that 800? You bet it is. You know you did it correct. All righty, so you've got to be able to manipulate quickly and correctly these cost, volume, profit analysis questions. They love that stuff. All righty, so key things to remember, folks, fixed cost and you know your desired profit. Well, if we knew, if they gave us my fixed cost is 100 and I desire a profit of 50 and I know my contribution margin as a percentage of sales is 12.5, then what would my sales have to be? A million two to earn a profit of 50. Your total fixed cost plus your target profit divided by your contribution margin as a percentage of sales, that tells you what your sales dollars have to be to get that particular target profit. All righty, so you gotta be able to manipulate this in a variety of different ways. Okay, let's try another one. Product Cot has sales of 200,000, a contribution margin of 20, a margin of safety of 80, stop right there. First thing I see is contribution margin. All righty, they gave me my contribution margin is 20%. That means my variable costs have got to be 80. My sales are 100. All right, so we got our ratios. We have current sales of 200,000. You've got a margin of safety. What is a margin of safety in English? It's a cushion. It's your sales above break even. Your sales in excess of break even. The higher your sales in excess of break even, the lower the operating risk. We like a big current level of sales above and beyond our break even point. This way, if God forbid there's a downturn in the economy and we sell less of our goods, I don't have to worry about having a loss. So, step number two margin of safety is your current sales level minus your break even sales. They gave me my margin of safety is 80. They told me my current sales are 200. What's got to be your break-even sales? 200 minus 80. My break-even point's got to be 120. All righty. They want to know, hey, what's your total fixed costs have to be? Okay, so there are a variety of ways of doing this, a variety of ways of doing this. You ready? Let me show you. Here's method number one. Method one, this is intuitive, all righty? So my sales, given information, at break-even point, it was given implicitly because they gave us current level of sales and margin of safety. So sales at break-even, 80,000. My total variable costs are 80% of those sales of $80,000. 
Okay. Sales at break even, 80,000. Total variable costs, 64,000. Okay. What's your contribution margin? What is that? 24,000? No, 26,000? Whatever that is. Okay. 64, no, 16,000. My bad. All right. So there's your sales at break even. Okay. At break even point, 80. Variable costs are 80%, 64,000. My margin of safety is 80. My break-even point, 120. Sorry, guys. My break-even sales are 120. 120,000 times 80%. 120,000 times 80%. What is that? Uh, $96,000. Is that right? So your contribution margin is $24,000. If you have break-even, if you're at break-even, then what kind of profit do you have? Zero. You'd have no profit. So therefore, your total fixed cost would also have to be what amount? The same as your contribution margin. That's one way of getting your total fixed cost. Okay, so that's one way of getting your total fixed cost. What's another way using your cost volume profit analysis formula? You ready? Total fixed cost divided by your contribution margin percentage. My break-even sales, again, are 120, 120,000. Again, current sales, 200,000. Minus your margin of safety, 80,000, dropping the zeros. There's your break-even sales, again, 120. All right, so there are my break-even sales. My contribution margin percentage, selling price, minus your variable cost, contribution margin, 20%, variable cost or 80%. Given information, if they gave you the variable cost, you could back into it, 20%. Solve for the numerator, 120,000 times 20%. What's my total fixed cost got to be? Same result, different formula. 24,000. So that's method number two. Either method, same result. This method is a little bit more intuitive. You do it step by step. Sales 120, that's your break even sales. Variable costs are 80% of sales, 96. So your contribution margin is 24. If you've got no profit, then your contribution margin and your total fixed costs, if they're the same, then your profit is obviously zero. We're looking to have a contribution margin above our profit, excuse me, above our fixed cost so we generate a profit. Or total fixed costs divided by contribution margin percentage gets you your break-even sales, which happens to be kind of given. We had to back into it, but then we take 120 times the 20%. We solve for our numerator, $24,000. So half of our students got that right. All righty. So there's your formulas again. Another method of doing this. Fixed costs plus your target profit divided by your contribution margin percentage, there's what your sales need to be. With a target profit of zero, then we're at break even sales of 120,000. We know our contribution margin is 20%. Multiply both sides by your 20%. Okay, multiply both sides by 20%. Okay. Fixed costs are equal to 20% of your sales in this case. Sales of 120 times the 20%. Total fixed cost, $24,000. So you have a variety of ways depending upon your comfort level. Speed is always secondary to accuracy, right? Speed is always secondary to accuracy. Here's the summary again, cost, volume, profit analysis. We're reminding you of those formulas so that you're okay. All righty, let's try another one. Now, hopefully you have a sharp object nearby. Uh, 
Madeline, Rebecca, did we remind the students today to bring a sharp object to uh, today's seminar? Did we remind them? You know, Pete, this we this we did not. Um, oh, man, all right, listen, I'm sorry. We were supposed to remind you to bring a sharp object. Grab the closest sharp object you have, because if you get this question wrong, I want you to take that sharp object and I want you to put it in your right ear and take it out your left ear. You get this one wrong, you should be bleeding. All right, break even point. What's your contribution margin equal to? Sales minus your total variable cost, contribution margin minus your fixed cost, your profit. If you're at break even, your profit is zero. So contribution margin and fixed cost should be one and the same. So at break even point, your contribution margin equals what? Fixed cost. You know what the most important thing about this question is? You get it right, but you get it right in five seconds accumulating the additional time for the more math intensive questions, okay? So that's the key with that question there. Now, I wanna show you something. You ready? When we do a contribution margin format income statement, what's a contribution margin? Variable costing, direct costing. You take your sales minus your variable costs. There's your contribution margin. You then subtract your fixed operating costs, things like depreciation, rent, insurance. That gets you your earnings before interest and tax. All right, your earnings before interest and tax. We haven't gone that far yet. So it's not really your total profit, it's your EBIT. You then subtract your interest cost, which is another cost independent of sales. It's a percentage of debt. That's how you get your earnings before tax, okay? And then you multiply by one minus your tax rate. Therein lies your net income. But folks, from sales down to EBIT, this is amplified by what's called operating leverage. If you take your percentage change in sales and you multiply that by your degree of operating leverage, you got your percentage change in EBIT. What if I told you my degree of operating leverage is two? and my change in sales was a plus 13%, then we could forecast our change in EBIT would be what? 13 times two, 26%. How do you get degree of operating leverage? Percentage change in your EBIT divided by your percentage change in your sales. Divided by your percentage change in your sales. So if I were given that my EBIT changed by 26 when my sales only changed by 13, I know my degree of operating leverage is two. Businesses have to make a decision what they want their fixed operating costs to be. And a lot of that is dictated by the industry you're in. When you're a manufacturer, you're going to have high fixed costs. There's no ways around it. But when you're an accounting firm, a law firm, you could have your costs either be you pay your people a salary, a fixed cost, or more commission-based, a variable cost. So folks, as your fixed costs go up, as your fixed costs go up, your degree of operating leverage goes up, all righty? A lot of times that's dependent upon the industry you're in. Now, what's the degree of financial leverage? That looks at, that looks at the difference between your EBIT and your earnings before tax. What if I told you, again, our percentage change in EBIT, you continuing this example, is 26%. Multiply that by, what if I told you your degree of financial leverage was 1.5? I can't do math in my head. What's 26 times 1.5? Here we go. 26 times 1.5. My percentage change in earnings before tax, that would be 39%. 39%. That's called your degree of financial leverage. Okay, you're amplifying your operating income by borrowing money rather than adding partners. When you borrow money, you're amplifying your risk assumed as well as your potential return. If they don't give you degree of financial leverage, how do you get it? Your percentage change in earnings before tax or net income or earnings per share divided by your percentage change in EBIT. So EBIT only went up by 26, but my earnings went up by 39. There's your degree of financial leverage. Folks, leverage is an amplifier. It amplifies the risk assumed as well as your potential return. Now, 
Leverage is amplified by using fixed costs. There are two types of fixed costs. There are fixed operating costs, salary rather than commission, depreciation, rent, insurance, and then there are fixed financing costs, your interest, borrowing money rather than adding partners, okay? That's capital structure. We're gonna see that in a second. Okay, let's try another one, number 13. How you guys feeling? Are you feeling mentally fatigued? Come on, man. We're only, we are only two hours and 15 minutes in. If this were the CPA exam, you don't almost still have another hour and 45 minutes. Can't get anything wrong because you're mentally fatigued, right? We're building up that mental endurance. Try number 13. Let's go. You ready? Hopefully you didn't start here with Lynn. What do they want me to do? How would Lynn's ratios using absorption costing be different from variable costing. Stop right there. Absorption is gap. That is used for external financial reporting. You got to use it for external financial reporting. Variable costing is used for managerial purposes. Internal decision making. Internal decision making. It separates the controllable variable costs from the less controllable fixed costs. Now, remember in the last seminar, fixed costs are usually, when they say nothing, uncontrollable. But read carefully. Sometimes fixed costs, some of that might be controllable, some of it's not controllable, okay? Now, how do you do absorption costing? Your regular income statement. Absorption, selling price, minus your cost of goods sold, your gross profit, Minus your SG&A, there's your EBIT, all right, or EBITDA, let's put minus your SG&A, minus your depreciation, there's your EBIT, all righty. So that's regular absorption. All right, folks, cost of goods sold, cost of goods sold. How do you get cost of goods sold? Your product cost per unit times number of units sold. How do you get your product cost per unit? Your direct materials plus your direct labor plus your variable overhead plus your fixed overhead. Manuf this is manufacturing overhead, factory overhead, okay? Not administrative, manufacturing or factory overhead. The key is under the gap method, fixed manufacturing overhead is a product cost. It is not expensed until the product is sold. Okay, it is not expensed until the product is sold. All righty, so that's gap. Now, how do you do variable costing? You ready? Variable costing. And let me do that on the next slide. Variable costing, you ready? Variable costing. It's your sales minus your variable cost, your direct materials, your direct labor, plus your variable overhead, variable overhead, as well as your variable S, G, and A. That gets you your contribution margin minus your fixed cost. Your fixed overhead, as well as your fixed S, G, and A. There's your EBIT. Folks, the main difference between absorption and variable costing, difference number one, difference number one is the format where things go, but the key difference number two is how we treat fixed manufacturing overhead. Under gap, under absorption, it's a product cost. Under variable costing, it's a period cost. We expense 100% of it in the period incurred. Under absorption, we only expense the fixed overhead cost per unit for the number of units sold. That is the primary difference other than the format of the financial statement, okay? Other than the format of the financial statement. Now, how do you predict the difference in net income? The difference in net income between the two methods, change in your ending inventory times the fixed overhead 
per unit. That's how you predict your difference in net income. All right. Now let's review this question. Here we go. They tell us we prepare income statements using the standard absorption versus the standard variable costing methods. For year two, standard costs were unchanged. In year two, the only uh, the only beginning and ending inventory of finished goods, 5,000. Stop right there. I have beginning inventory, 5,000. I have ending inventory, 5,000 units. What's your change in inventory? Confidence building question, zero. Change in ending inventory, zero. Times your fixed overhead per unit, what's the difference in net income? Anything multiplied by zero is zero. There is no difference in net income. Net income is exactly the same because there's no change in ending inventory. Now, when there's no change in ending inventory, when there's no change in ending inventory, both methods expense 100% of the fixed manufacturing overhead both methods however however under absorption it's part of cost of goods sold under variable costing it's a period cost all right, so the location is different, all righty? So they wanna know, hey, what's gonna be the difference in these ratios? What's the current ratio, current asset divided by current liability? Remember, under absorption, under absorption, fixed overhead per unit is part of inventory your inventory is going to be higher under the absorption so under the absorption method the ending inventory is going to have a higher value under absorption because that fixed overhead per unit is a product cost instead of a period cost so the value of the ending inventory under absorption is higher so your current ratio is going to be higher it's got to be c or d how about return on stockholders equity net income divided by equity. Equity is assets minus liabilities, equity, right? Folks, if your ending inventory is higher, then your assets are higher. If your assets are higher, then your equity is higher. Net income is the same in this question. Why is it the same? Because there's no change in ending inventory. My numerator did not change. But under absorption, your equity is higher because your assets are higher. Why are your assets are higher? Because your fixed manufacturing overhead is not a period cost, it's a product cost. It's part of your ending inventory, giving you a higher asset, that's a higher equity. Higher equity, what does that do to your return on equity? A smaller return on equity. Choice D. Choice D. This is really knowing your stuff. It's not about memorizing. This is about really understanding. So folks, check this out. 78% of people got that wrong, okay? When you know and you understand, you're not gonna have a problem with a question like this. But notice how challenging this was. Without numbers to back it up, this is what makes the exam more challenging today, especially in 2024, where they're getting further away from remembering and understanding and just memorizing stuff. That analysis, that application, this is a higher level of difficulty, okay? But when you really understand, you could do this stuff. So there's our beautiful detailed explanatory answer. Now we are ready to do some task-based simulations. Hey, Pete, got, I wanna hey. jump in uh, for a second for a time check. Um, we have um, a number of questions we wanted to ask you live before we finish. So maybe that you, when you finish this uh, TBS, you can- No, nah, you know what? No, nah, wait, listen, it's a good opportunity. If anybody's got to do pee pee, hopefully you're wearing a diaper, just sit in your seat and do it right there. If you don't have a diaper on, still do it in your seat to remind yourself you better wear a diaper exam day. Shoot, Rob. Let's do a couple of questions and then I'll bang out this task-based simulation and I'll leave the last two for next time. Go ahead, Rob. What you so, got? So, uh, Madeline, do you want to do some of those questions? Hi, 
sorry, looking for my mute button. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, let's take a little break. Um, hey, this is Madeline, by the way. She's uh, she's all things U World, and and we also have Rebecca on the line. They help out with all the marketing and and stuff like that. So, uh, um, yeah, any questions you always have about the um, you know, deals with firms and and universities and all that kind of stuff, you could always reach out to Matt or or Rebecca or we have other folks as well. But I'm sorry, Madeline, go ahead. I just wanted them to know. Yeah. Who you were. No, oh, thanks, Pete. I appreciate it. And we're always happy to help. Uh, we are behind the scenes answering these questions as best we can. Some, though, we want to save for you. So we've had a few people mention that they are really hours away from taking their exam. We have someone who's 48 hours away, somebody, uh, BEC specifically, is taking yep. it on October 26th, looking for advice, tips for those final days leading up to the BEC exam specifically. All right, so in general, what I tell people, hopefully you should have had at least a week. I hope you had get, saved yourself at least a week. But folks, when you're doing your final review, you're no longer learning new information. In that final week, you should be taking a minimum of three practice tests, folks, three. Why? Because you gotta practice allocating your time between your first two tests, it's the multiple choice, and then your last three testlets, which are which are your task-based simulations, and don't forget in BEC, the written communication. So you should be spending your time not reading or watching lectures. You should be working questions. You know, and in your final couple of days, it's all about working questions. But hopefully you've been doing that for a while, but you gotta practice your time allocation. With respect to the written communication, folks, look, if English is your first language, this is not about, you know, they want they don't want you to list formulas and, and you know, nah, it, it's about writing style. Like, can you write grammatically correct, which I would have a difficult time with, but, you know, you know, it, 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 punctuation. They want to make sure that you know how to express yourself professionally in English. Now, they're doing away with this in 2024, but because the exam is international, this is really about candidates that are outside of the U.S. English is not their first language. They want to make sure they can you know, write a memo to a partner, a client, a subordinate, a manager, address what's the issue. Hey, here would be the rules. Here's my analysis, state your conclusion, but it's done professionally. For the most part, if English is your first language, it's not a heavy lift for the written communication. Just look at the way we're setting up our answers, but it's machine graded, believe it or not. So it's not about, you know, you gotta be on, you know, you can't write about your favorite color or whether or not you believe in aliens. That, that, that you can't do. It's gotta be on, you know, topic, but it's mostly about being able to express yourself professionally. Look at our detailed explanatory answers. You'll be in great shape, but you should be doing practice exams, practice exams. What great. else you got, thank Matt? You. Yeah, thank you for covering a written communication because that was another question that yep. came in. Um, all right, here's something a little bit more specific. Uh, somebody mentions, I always get confused. What is the difference between EBIT and EBITDA? And oh, I hope I come on, man, that's beautiful. Ready? EBIT and EBITDA. Let me get a blank. Let me get a, let me get some white space here. Let me let me slide over here and then I'll erase this later. Uh, I don't have any whites. Okay, so EBIT is earnings before interest and tax. So if you took your uh, a regular gap income statement, I just need some room. Come on, man. I write everywhere. There we go. You ready? Your sales minus your cost of goods sold. There's your gross profit. Minus your selling general and administrative, other than depreciation. There's your earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization. Then you subtract your duh, and there's your EBIT. Then you subtract your interest, and there's your earnings before tax. The EBITDA is used in the real world. Lots of times companies that are being valued and it's difficult to forecast future cash flow or project future cash flow. EBITDA is oftentimes a metric that's used for valuation. Hey, what did this company sell at relative to their EBITDA? What multiple of EBITDA did they sell at? In the real world, that's very valuable because depreciation and amortization is skewed by the age of your assets the method of depreciation, estimates for salvage value and use for life. So in capital intensive industries, if you want a quick way to try to value a company, boil, you know, um, uh, you know, rule of thumb or, or just like a, a, you know, a quick valuation, you take that company's EBITDA, 
and multiply that by the average multiple of EBITDA other companies have recently sold for, that's a quick way to get valuation for a company. So that's oftentimes what you use EBITDA for. It's also a proxy for your earnings uh, cash flow wise, but it's not really operating cash flow, but it's sometimes used as a proxy for that because we're ignoring the depreciation and amortization. But that's the difference between EBITDA and EBIT. Thank you. That was a good one. Okay. Here's a more general one. Uh, what is the best way to get back into studying after failing the exam and then cramming to try again? Oh, I don't like the word cramming. What are you doing cramming? All right, now maybe you're up against the 18 month window and you got to cram, okay? But the second time around, folks, you reverse your study process. First time around, you general rule, watch the lecture first. We're gonna walk you through it as though you've never seen it before. We don't want you wasting valuable study time, spinning your wheels on content that you may not have seen in two or three years. Or you might've got a C on it and you get psyched out. I don't give a shit if you got a C or not. You bring us the C, we'll get you the P and the A, no worries. But general rule of thumb, first time around, you watch the lecture, we'll do multiple choice with you, you'll then do practice multiple choice. You'll then come back, watch the next subtopic lecture, I'll do, we'll do multiple choice with you, then you do multiple choice. Then at the end of that subtopic, then we'll do a task-based simulation together, practice it, you'll see how we do it, then you'll do your task-based simulations, okay? And then we don't want you wasting valuable study time between classes pre-reading, all right, I'd rather you spend your valuable time between classes practicing what we've already went through rather than spinning your wheels. When it's the second time around, please do not waste time watching lectures on the front end and reading. No, no, no. It's more about application, working problems, working questions. You then cherry pick the lectures you're going to have to rewatch based upon your performance on the prior exam and how you do it now on the multiple choice second time around. So you flip it over, you start with your pro your multiple choice and your problems first, then you rewatch the lecture. And for everybody, you should not be doing task-based simulations unless you feel very, very comfortable and confident with that subject matter. Because task-based simulations would be challenging even if it were an open book test because of the volume of information. Look at this shit. I mean, when we do this task-based simulation, look at all this crap you're giving it. You gotta answer all these questions. Oh my God, it's overwhelming. That's why it's so important to have a good mastery of the concept Multiple choice, that's why we start with multiple choice. Good way to cover a lot of ground and get yourself confident with that content. So second time around, please spend most of your time working questions and look, this is why your firms need, I was joked on LinkedIn, monogamy, save it for your relationship. And some people don't even want it with their relationship. I don't know what people do, whether it's your business, but where was I going with this? So yeah, your firm, please let people have options with courses. You don't want to work the same damn questions you, for you again and again and again. And, and you know what? You fail. They fail. You fail with them. You need something different. You need new questions, a new approach. That's why your firm should open this up and allow other um, CPA review courses to have an opportunity to teach you and serve you and give you questions. You don't want to simply rework the same question because you know the damn answer is C. And you know what? What value are you getting from that, right? You got to apply it to a different set of facts to reinforce that knowledge. Damn it. <laughs> I appreciate the passion. Let's do one more and then you can get uh, back into the content. You got it. Uh, all right. So we had a couple questions where there was just general concern at this point with BEC going away December 15th. And by the way, if you haven't applied for it yet and you're planning to do it before December 15th, make sure that you do ASAP. But is there at this point, October 21st, enough time? By December 15th, um, well, here's the deal. If God forbid you don't get it, a lot of this content you're studying is gonna apply to the bar exam, okay? Or it'll apply to audit because some of the IT stuff is going to audit. A lot of this is going to the bar exam. So it's not going to be a waste of your time. That's number one. So if God forbid you don't get BEC out of the way in 2023, what we're reviewing here and what you would be studying, if you get it, get it in December, great. You don't have to worry about the disciplines. But if God forbid you don't, well, all of this knowledge will be on the bar section of the exam. And if you're an audit, but you're not IT, well, then you know what? You, you would want to sit for bar anyway. Now, look, if you're a tax person, 
you really would try to get BEC out of the way, um, you know, or you wouldn't want to waste time studying BEC because chances are, if you're a tax person, the discipline you'd want to sit for is DC, TCP, where you really want to learn that tax uh, planning anyway. So look, it's not the end of the world. You do your best to get it. Um, if you're an audit and you don't get BEC in 2023, then all this knowledge, you, you'll use it when you study for the bar exam. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. I, I, you know, there's pros and cons. Like, you know, for me, everybody's trying to get 2023 out of the way to avoid a discipline in 2024 because that's the higher level of application. But if you're asking me, you're paying the AICPA for an education, whether it be an IT, bar, financial, cost and managerial or tax planning. Don't you want to learn that information? I mean, I don't think it's so awful to have to study for that discipline, especially when you get to choose it. And it's based upon your career path. I mean, it's only going to help you build your body of knowledge to be better at what you do. So I don't think it's the end of the world. I mean, everyone's trying to get BC out of the way, and I get it, because, you know, path of least resistance. But on the other hand, you know, you're freaking paying a lot of money, you know, all this stuff. And even in terms, even if your firm covers the cost for all this, still in terms of time, you know, don't you want to study stuff that's going to benefit you in your in your future, you know? So have that attitude, you know, but it's all good. You know, if you get it, you get it. If you don't, we'll cross that bridge, man. There's pros to everything. The glass is always half full. Isn't that right? Absolutely. But I want to just make sure we get back to what the specific question was right now. Is there enough time? I think that there is. Oh, is there enough time? Oh, yeah. All right. So yeah. look, how did you do in cost accounting? How did you do in managerial accounting? All right. If you got a C in it and you took it 10 years ago, I don't think you're studying for BEC. There's not enough time. If you're a recent college grad and you got an A or a B in cost and managerial, because that's really the more difficult concepts, right? I think you could do it. You know, so if you're a recent college grad, you did decent in cost and managerial. If you had a class in corporate finance, I think you could do it. The corporate governance is all theory. You could study that in a couple of days. That's not that bad. The IT for me would be a problem for you young folks. I don't think the IT, especially what it is on BEC is basic fundamentals. It's not like the ISC discipline. It's at a far lower level of difficulty. And, and you know, that's a lot of theory. So the corporate governance and the IT is not a big deal. What takes time is the cost accounting, the managerial, the corporate finance and the econ. So if you did decent in those topics and or you're a recent college grad, or you can take time off. I mean, if you could take some time off, you could get this done before December 15th. But look, you know, and if you can't take time off, then you know what, Saturdays and Sundays, you're gonna devote, you know, eight hours a day. And then you gotta get me an hour or two during the week, get up earlier. So yeah, there's enough time, you could do it. If you really wanna do it, two months is way more than enough time for BEC. Unless you've been out of school for 20 years or you got a, a D in cost and managerial, then maybe not. But that's probably 5% of the population out there. 95% of you, absolutely you can get this done before December 15th. Great. Thank you so much, Pete. We have a little over 20 minutes left, so I will let you continue at this point. All right. All right. You know what, guys? I'm going to reward you. Now, look, I'm going to save the more challenging vign uh, vignettes here for the next one. Um, and. Uh, we're going to be doing, what's the date of the other one while we're on this, Matt? I'm sorry. What's the date of the next one? November. Sorry. November. Sorry about that. Going back to my screen. Um, okay. It's the Saturday before Thanksgiving, November 18th. Okay. So folks, November 18th, I got two task-based simulations that I'm going to save for next time that are brand new. The November 18th three-hour seminar is going to be a, a mixture of uh, multiple choice task-based simulation, but there'll be two task-based simulations that I will work with you to start on November 18th that we're not doing today, okay? So I know I got to wrap this up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an opportunity to do this one, and then we're going to cover it together. So I'm actually going to go to this task. Look at this. Look at the mountain of stuff. Damn. Oh, my God. All right, let's do this one. Take a screenshot of it, folks. You ready? I'm going to give you an opportunity. Get your cameras out or do your screenshot on your computer. Come on, you IT kids. You know how to do that stuff. So get your um, get your camera out. You guys got that? I'm going to give you all the information. You ready? So there's your, uh, there's your first slide. Take a picture of this one. Okay. Take a picture of that one. Here's your exhibits. Take a picture of exhibit number one. 
Here's exhibit number two. Damn, look at all that information. A comparative trial balance. Oh, my goodness gracious me. Oh, and it continues. All right. Pre-closing, folks. How do we know it's pre-closing? What do we see in there? We still got our revenues and expenses. All right. So it's a pre-closing trial balance. So you got all your assets, liabilities, revenues, expenses, gains, and losses. That's still a continuation of exhibit number two. All righty. Along with the notes at the bottom. All right. So you got all those exhibits. All right, folks. So there's all the given information. All right. So take a second, set it up. And then I'll jump in and do it with you. I'll give you a minute to set it up. PD, come say hello to my class. Just say hello. PT, this is my boy Pete. PD, uh, the camera's on this side, but PD, okay. come over here. This is my son. Look, look at that. If you got time today, if you got no family, no friends, no job, you got and no pet, nothing to do. Look at my boy Petey, 18. There's a video of us. I'm holding him. He was a little baby 18 years ago. My big Pete over here. What's up, Petey boy? Thank you, sir. All right. Good luck, guys. All right. Thank you, Pete. And I got Belly here. All right. You guys ready? Let's bang this out. So here we go. They tell us utility is a distributor of fine, new, and antique parts. All right. That's all nice. Their sales are on credit. Cool. Merchandise is sold to independent retailers and, uh, Whatever through the U.S., antique pieces generally sold through decorators. All right. They tell us for items one through nine, step number one on the exam, folks, before you look at the exhibits, what's always step number one? What do they want me to do with that mountain of information? All righty. So step number one, what do they want me to do? Here we go. Determine and select whether each metric indicates a significant fluctuation in the utilities working capital cycle. Stop right there. A fluctuation in what? Working capital. What's working capital? So I stop and I say, well, working capital is what? Current assets minus current liabilities. That looks as your working capital. The less current assets, the more current liabilities, the lower your working capital, the higher your risk. But folks, when you have less current assets, that means you must have more non-current assets. Lower risk, and that should be a higher risk. Lower working capital, less current assets, higher risk, but higher return on assets. The return on non-current assets is generally higher than the return. What kind of return when you get money in the bank? You don't get much. All righty, so working capital focuses in on what are your current assets again? Cash, marketable securities, accounts receivable, inventory, prepaids. Working capital focuses in on short-term risk of financial distress. Can you pay your bills as they become due? That's what working capital focuses in on. All righty. When you look at things like accounts receivable, inventory, your current liabilities, like accounts payable, what are we focusing in on? Can this company generate cash from their core business? Working capital and short term risk of distress focuses in on your number of days to sell plus your number of days to collect. I promised you earlier, I was gonna show you how to calculate those items. We got them here. Minus your number of days to repay your vendor, there's your cash conversion cycle. Folks, you wanna sell quick without giving it away. You wanna collect quick without upsetting your customers. You wanna stretch it out, folks. You want the number of days to repay your vendor Unless you're given a discount, stretch it out. Where do we want our cash conversion cycle to be? Less than or equal to the standard. That means there's less risk of financial distress. That's what we're focusing in on here. Now, how do you get your number of days to sell? That is 365 divided by your inventory turnover. How do we get our inventory turnover? Cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. Number of days to collect, 365 divided by accounts receivable turnover. How do we get accounts receivable turnover? Net sales divided by average receivables. 
Number of days to repay the vendor, 365 divided by accounts payable turnover. That's a function of purchases. If you got it, if you don't got it, use cost of goods sold divided by average accounts payable. We are focusing in on this company's short-term risk of distress. Now, they simply want to know, does each metric, is that going to affect your assessment of short-term risk of distress? Is current ratio relevant when you assess short-term risk of distress? You bet it is. I don't need to look at any numbers. They didn't ask me for the trend. They just want to know, do these metrics affect your assessment of working capital? And you look at working capital to assess short-term risk of distress. Folks, the higher your current assets, the lower your current liabilities, the higher your current ratio, the lower your risk of short-term distress. But folks, when you have high current assets, the return on current assets tends to be lower. So there's good news, bad news. You're gonna have lower risk of financial distress, but you're likely to have a lower return on asset. But yeah, that's relevant. How about number two? Quick ratio. I don't need to look at any numbers. What is the quick ratio? We look at everything except inventory and prepaids. Divide that by current liabilities. No change to the numerator, but excuse me, no change to the denominator, but we make the numerator smaller. We back out the inventory. That's another way to assess short-term risk. And on the exam, when would you want to use the quick ratio? When the company's accounts receive a, excuse me, inventory turnover is too low. It's not liquid. When their number of days to sell is too high, it's taken them too long to sell their goods, then that tells you inventory is not liquid. Then when you assess their short-term risk of distress, you better exclude the inventory if for whatever reason right now you can't turn it over. But again, is that relevant in assessing short-term risk of distress? Yes, I don't need any of those exhibits. You know what all these exhibits are? You start to see this? See all these exhibits? Distractor information. Somebody's going to foolishly be looking at these exhibits before they looked at what they were supposed to do with the information. They don't ask you to calculate a single damn thing. And all this is distractor information. Or as my buddy Rob likes to call it, distractor information is TP. If you print this out, and you're studying in the bathroom and you run out of toilet paper, use that sheet of paper right there because that's all it's good for. It's got no bearing on the solution. So that's why you never ever rush and read the exhibits without knowing what to do with it first. Look at number three, what is the defensive interval? It's the same numerator as quick, same numerator as the quick ratio, current assets minus the inventory and the prepaids, but Instead of dividing by current liabilities, you know what we divide it by? Average daily cash expenditures. Your average daily cash expenses. What this is going to convert the quick ratio to is days. Given what you have available in the numerator, how many days can you operate? Okay, without selling more inventory, we're excluding the inventory. Okay, just with your cash, all you're left with is your cash, your marketable securities, and accounts receivable. How many days can you last without selling more inventory? So, your assessment the bigger the cash, marketable securities, and receivables, and the lower your daily cash expendable expenditures. The lower your denominator, the more days you have, the lower the risk of financial distress. It looks at what you have in the numerator to cover those average daily cash expenditures. How many days can you continue on without turning over any more inventory, okay? So it's another metric when assessing short-term risk of distress. Is that relevant? You bet it is, all right? Now, if this is a math question, you know what you got to be on the lookout for? The denominator is cash expenditures. So what are we going to exclude from that? When you calculate your total expenses and you divide that by 365, you get your average number of days. Folks, you take your total expenses but exclude 
you're going to exclude depreciation and amortization. You exclude depreciation and amortization. Why? They are non-cash expenses. So you take all your expenses, back out the depreciation and amortization. We're taking all our operating expenses minus the depreciation and amortization. Divide that by 365, and that's how you get your denominator. So again, you take all your operating expenses, okay, your total operating expenses minus depreciation and amortization. That's your average daily cash expenditures, okay? Exclude the non-cash expenses, all righty? And the more days you have, the less risk. How about debt to equity? Does that have any bearing on short-term risk of distress? No. Folks, debt to equity, and I'm just going to move to this slide so I'm, I'm not squeezing things in. Folks, debt to equity looks at long-term risk. It looks at solvency, long-term risk. It focuses in on your capital structure. So that's a no, folks. That's a no. That has no bearing. That is not current assets and current liabilities. That's a big fat no. All right, we're looking at your capital structure, your debt versus your equity. So look, when you have more debt and you have less equity, when you have more liabilities and you have less equity, you are less solvent. There's greater risk, okay, long-term risk. Not short-term risk, long-term risk. This is a way, this is what focuses in on your degree of financial leverage. Do you want to take on debt to amplify your potential return? Remember what we said, your percentage change in EBIT times that degree of financial leverage, there's your percentage change in earnings, in net income, earnings before tax, your earnings. Okay, are you willing and able to assume that level of risk that has overlap with corporate governance, enterprise risk management? the company's willingness and ability to assume more risk. So folks, when you have a high debt to equity, you have greater risk of distress, I know that, but when you have less equity, that gives you a higher potential return on equity, all righty? So the degree of financial leverage, that looks at capital structure solvency more long-term when you're a stockholder, return on equity, long-term investment. All righty. It's also important when assessing credit rating. With credit rating, we don't just look at short-term distress. Credit rating also looks at long-term, but that has nothing to do with working capital. Okay, that's assessing the short-term risk of distress. All righty. Now, if on the other hand, you have less debt, more equity, when you have a lower debt to equity, folks, there's good news and bad news. From a risk standpoint, there's less risk. You've been very conservative in the way you've raised your capital. But now, folks, with all those partners, you've now diluted your earnings per share. So less risk, a lower return on equity. And also, by adding all those partners, you might be diluting your influence, your control when you issue more shares of stock and add partners, okay? Different assessment. All right. The times interest earn ratio. EBIT, earnings before interest and tax, divided by your interest charges. That's not assessing working capital. So folks, that's a big fat no that has nothing to do with working capital, current assets, current liabilities. Again, capital structure, a coverage ratio. The more EBIT you have, the less interest. The higher your coverage ratio is, any coverage ratio, folks, the higher the coverage ratio, the less risk. But this is more of a long-term metric. Interest has to be paid over a period of time. When we're looking at debt, for the most part, debt tends to be long-term, right? Think about your bonds, your debentures, your mortgages. So this is more of a measure of long-term, not short-term risk of distress. The bigger the spread between the numerator and the denominator, the lower the risk. Now, remember, when you have less interest expense, there's good news, bad news. Sorry about that. Less interest expense implies less debt. Less debt implies more equity. If you don't have a lot of debt and you have a lot more equity, don't expect what? A high return on equity. No free lunch, folks. No free lunch. But it has nothing to do with working capital. How about accounts receivable turnover? Yes, that's part of the cash conversion cycle. 
365 divided by that accounts receivable turnover. I want to collect quickly. I don't want my sales sitting uncollected. What is it, your number of days to collect? Your number of days to collect in your accounts receivable turnover, what's that highly correlated with? Your credit policy. When you have a very strict credit policy, your number of days to collect should be relatively low because you're not lending money to anybody who walks in the door. You're only gonna lend the money if you take the time to check the credit rating and the credit worthy. But remember, a strict credit policy, while that helps your number of days to collect, that's probably gonna hurt your number of days to sell because you're not gonna just give credit to anybody. What, no credit, no problem? Yeah, I don't think so. There's gonna be a big problem when you can't collect, okay? So that's a yeah. inventory turnover. Again, yeah, that's very important. Cash conversion cycle. Can you generate cash from your core business? So folks, your inventory turnover, 365. I want my inventory to turn over. I want my number of days to sell, all things being equal, to be lower. I want to be able to turn my inventory over and create a sale. But remember, you better make sure you're selling to people who are credit worthy, right? And the other thing is don't give it away. You might have high turnover and you might have a lot of sales, but the problem is you're not making a profit because you're giving, you know who has the highest turnover? Companies that are liquidating and going out of business because they cut the price and it's so discounted, they're not going to make any money on it, but they got to liquidate the inventory because they got to get the hell out of that store because they're closing down, all righty? But that is relevant for working capital. How about return on total assets? No, that's a long-term measure of performance. That is a long-term measure of performance, folks. When you look at return on asset, that helps you determine how the company is performing, all righty? Net income from your income statement, when you mix income statement with balance sheet, the balance sheet number, if possible, should be an average. You want a lot of income, you want a high return on asset. The problem is when you assess performance, a measure of performance like return on asset has nothing to do with working capital, performance. You want to make sure the return on the asset is greater than the cost. Are you adding value to your net worth? Now, you also want to break down return on asset into its core components, profit margin and asset turnover. Why do you want to break it down into its core components, profit margin and turnover? Profit margin is heavily dictated by what? Competition. As competition goes up, profit margins come down. That's generally less controllable. That's generally dictated by the industry you're in. Is it pure competition, monopolistic competition, or is it an oligopoly or a monopoly? When it's an oligopoly or monopoly, you have really high margins. But when you have a lot of competition, that's low margins. And then turnover, folks, that's management efficiency, the right number of assets. Folks, the average assets, how much inventory to produce, how much PP&E to buy, Starbucks, how many stores do you want to have? Five guys, burgers and fries, what's the right number of stores? Too many stores, you're not going to get a return to justify the cost of opening those stores. Conversely, too few assets, not enough inventory, not enough airplanes, not enough trucks, you're not gonna have enough assets to meet the demand for your product, you're gonna lose sales, and therefore you're not gonna be as profitable as you should be. So that management has a lot more control over, okay, the asset turnover. But again, nothing to do with working capital and short-term risk of distress. How about the number of days on average your inventory? We already said that, okay, inventory turnover and your number of days to sell, absolutely critical when assessing short-term risk of distress and working capital. Can you generate cash from your core business? What the cash conversion cycle, those three components, number of days to sell, number of days to collect, number of days to repay the vendor, it tells you on average, how long does it take you to generate cash from your core business? When you can generate cash from your core business, there's much less risk of financial distress because when you could do that, you'll amplify your current assets. In the quick ratio, you'll have a bigger numerator. Bigger numerator, bigger coverage, less risk. All those exhibits, the key point in this question, not only reviewing the ratios, but it was about, hey, 
do never look at those exhibits without knowing what to do with them first. Because many times exhibits can contain distractor information. Maybe not all of it, like in this one was an extreme case. All those exhibits were nonsense. Okay, but in other cases, there are certain exhibits that are less important than others. You gotta know in advance, what do I need to do with that information before I read it? And you might be saying, oh, nonsense, I'm just gonna read things in the order in which they're given. Think about this example. I tell you to go outside for 10 minutes. You go outside for 10 minutes, you come back in. I say, how many people were wearing hats? And you're like, Pete, I have no idea. I didn't know I was supposed to look for that, right? Conversely, if I had told you on the front end, go outside for 10 minutes and count the number of people wearing hats, you'll have no problem quickly telling me how many people were wearing hats because you knew what to look for. It's the same damn thing. Never read those facts without knowing what to do with it first. Let's go. Come on, man, it's two o'clock. You gotta love it. Talk about efficiency, baby. Now we have time for another question or I'll stay here as long as it takes, man. But, um, oh yeah, let me put that back up. I'm sorry, guys. And and I, um, Matt, I gotta put up that other slide. Hold on. Why isn't this working? All right, come on. Ah, hold on. Oh no, I can't. Why can't I get that slide up there? Come on, man. Oh, Matt, I don't know if you could give yourself back control real quick and put up the Google Slides. Oh, wait a second. Maybe I need to do that first. Wait a second. Wait a second. Maybe I needed to do that first. Yeah, I needed to do that first. Hold on. Hold on. All right. We just did. I just drill you guys to death. All right. So, folks, November 18th. Whoop. I want to go back. November 18th, we're going to be doing another one. So if you're not taking BEC between now and November 18th, if you're taking it after November 18th, you'll still have another month. You could take it up to December 15th. I'll be doing our last free BEC work camp, uh, boot camp, um, doing two task-based simulations. Next time, I will start with those two. So I'm spending the bulk of that time on the next one on task-based simulations you haven't seen before. And then I'm going to do a mix of some questions that we've seen before, but way earlier, or maybe you didn't tend an earlier event, but at the minimum, I'll start with those two task-based simulations on the front end. So you'll get a lot out of at least the first hour. So you got to register for that, spread the word. Again, our goal is to earn your business. All right. Not only myself, but Roger, the entire team, Rob and his team, very passionate. Want to see you get through this. We love what we do. I love having the opportunity for two and a half decades, teaching all these people at the firm's I want you to still have the opportunity to learn with me. Ask people at the firms. Yeah, forget the course they took. It's like the Yankees, right? You rooting for the laundry or you rooting for the player? You know what? The Yankees don't have very good players right now. That's why they're not in the freaking World Series. Back in the day when they had Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle, and Roger Phillips, then they were kicking ass and winning World Series. So don't root for the laundry. Tell them, hey, where are the players? So And Roger's amazing, man. Roger's the best in the business. You could Google that and find that out for yourself. But this is for our November 18th boot camp. And then... Um, if you're looking for a 2024 scholarship, now look, maybe you haven't studied for any parts yet. You're just dabbling. If you want a scholarship for all four parts, we are giving away a scholarship. You got to apply for this. But not only that, we're choosing people who will not only get the scholarship, but they're going to get to come to Dallas, uh, a free, a free trip. I wish it was South beach, but Rob is paying for that for our team. But so it's going to be Dallas, which is pretty cool. And you're going to be at the all expense paid trip. Come hang out, put you in a nice hotel. We can hang out and talk about the CPA exam or anything you want to talk about. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun, but you got to apply for that. If, if it doesn't apply to you, maybe you could share this with your friends and colleagues and stuff, but we're going to be hanging out. Woo, baby, let's go. I just gave birth to a successful BEC candidate. What do we got, Mad, Rebecca, Rob? What else we got? Thanks so much, Pete. Actually, can we flip to the next slide? Is there a, a slide on the 2024 exam? Oh, or wait, course? oh, there's another one. Hold on. Oh, there we go. I left one out. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. So, so Matt, I'll let you address this. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Thanks so much, Pete. So we've mentioned this a few times that the new 2024 course will go live October 31st. If you are coming in as a brand new student, and we take all kinds of new students. So if you're coming from another course that didn't work for you, we do have a fresh start discount. You can get the course brand new 2024, come on in. However, if you're an existing student of the current Wiley CPA review or UWorld CPA review, 
and your course is still active. So if you have any of those unlimited packages, this applies to you. Um, you will have access within your UWorld account to the 2024 course materials. Now with this, we have about 8,000 questions. We'll have a whole bunch of new lecturers as Pete had mentioned earlier in this presentation, showing all those fantastic subject matter experts, Peter Olinto, Roger Phillip, all teaching throughout the program. Everything's mapped to the AICPA blueprint, so you can know that you are studying exactly what the new blueprints map out now. And everything roots into the 94% pass rate that this is what has led to that. The methodology, the UWorld method has led to that pass rate and that will still be there. All the great questions, the answer explanations that Pete was showing with all those illustrations and uh, Rob's that Rob's team has been working so hard on. So that will all be there come 2024. And I also wanna point out folks embedded in our course, not some other product that we make you go watch, solving problems it's built into our course you don't need another resource working multiple choice it's right there when you do the lecture we do questions together so then you could practice multiple choice when you're done with all your multiple choice we first do a task-based simulation together then you practice on your own you don't you don't have to like go with to some other product or nonsense so somebody's making it seem like they're giving you something extra it's built in and we have live online reviews problem solving workshops where we're gonna be working additional multiple choice, additional task-based simulation, that again, not only reviews the concepts, but hey, how do you go through this efficiently? How do you read it? What are you thinking? How do you set this up like we did with that task-based simulation, right? Don't waste time with the exhibits until you see what the question's asking first. We have that all for you, okay? So it's all part of that package and we're extremely excited about that. Um, any other questions? Oh yeah, you know, and I, I just want to ask you again. You know, what we you know would hope uh, is that we're earning your the reputation that we want. We're earning your you know uh, uh, endorsement. Uh, please let your firms know and your universities know this is craziness to to x out any other review course. What are they afraid of? Let the people choose. Let them have the option at that firm to get either course you know, and reimburse depending upon or direct bill depending upon, hey, what's going to work for you, right? So, you know what, make it fair. And, and if they're as good as they say they are, they should be welcoming the competition. When they're looking at, look, what does that tell you about somebody who doesn't want competition? Because they don't have the confidence in their product to stand by it. We welcome it. No problem. We don't, just put us, just give us the opportunity side by side. Let's go. You're going to like our shirt. <laughs> what else we got? That URL blue looks good on you, Pete. Just gotta say it. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so we actually, we, we answered a lot of the questions in the chat and during that break period. So I think we are good. You did another fantastic job with this boot camp, and I know the next one's gonna be just as great. All right, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rebecca, for joining us today. Everybody else online answering questions. On behalf of everyone at UWorld, sincerely, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you're taking BEC soon, Please keep me posted. I'm on LinkedIn. I would love to hear about how you did. Um, if uh, if uh, you're taking it after November 18th, I'll see you guys on November 18th. But good luck studying. You can and you will do it. Slow and steady wins the race. Put the pen to the paper. Make sure you're writing down your own notes and, and you're working those problems. If you get something wrong, it's okay. Just learn from your mistakes, all righty? I'll see you guys on November 18th or on LinkedIn, whatever it may be. Good luck.